and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 385. That's 385. 385. Is it 385? Or is it 386? Let me double check my notes here. 385 with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How's it going? How are you feeling? How are you? Great, amazing. I'm fine. Thanks for asking. If it's your first time tuning in via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. That would be greatly appreciated. You don't have to do much in, in order to support the podcast. So I appreciate the views. But if you can make sure you're smashing that thumbs up on the stream, making sure you're smashing the thumbs up on the clips, I would be so, so appreciative. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, can you hear me? Can you hear me talking into your ear? Then please make sure you leave me a five-star review, download the show and share it with your friends. And of course, if you want to support the show via Patreon, you're more than welcome to. The Patreon link is in the show notes and it's also in the pinned comments of this YouTube video. Support the show on Patreon for a little as one dollar. Only one dollar, you get access to my entire library of shows as well as this show in audio format before it comes out anywhere else. Before it's available on YouTube, before it's available on these other platforms, you get it directly available on Patreon. So make sure you tune in there before it goes anywhere else. Log in on Patreon as little as one dollar. Support the show via Patreon, support the guy, make it happen. Click that link. Let's get involved. Anyway, we're here, we're feeling fresh as you can tell, I'm pumped, I'm amped, I'm ready to go, I just got back from the gym, had a good pump on as you can tell, right, I'm filling up my shirt a little bit, look, look at my shoulders, eh, looking all nice and strong, today, or no, this week has mostly been starting strength, right, starting strength is a pretty basic um, strength and conditioning program in, in terms of the core um, workouts and sort of, uh, yeah, the, the, the core sort of workouts you're doing with a barbell, effectively you're doing bench presses, squats, presses, um, um, overhead presses, sorry, deadlifts and power cleans, that's for the most part and of course there's some um, auxiliary workouts included too, like dips and pull-ups. But I love it for its simplicity, right? Simplicity is the key for me. I don't want to overthink things. I don't like having too many options. I just like to pick something and go with it. So I'm going to stick with this for the next six weeks. And of course, um, with it being sober October, it's the perfect, perfect workout for this um, short period of time when I'm going to be abstaining from alcohol and drugs. It's going to allow me to really focus in and make sure that I do what's necessary when it comes to getting fit, strong and powerful out here. You get me? We're not, we're not playing any games. We're not playing any games. So um, the workouts are pretty okay at the moment, actually. They're going pretty well. I'm, I'm filling up with a lot of energy. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the strength and conditioning side of things. And then from next week, I'm going to implement the running protocol, which is going to include some of the power, speed, and endurance workouts that I've done prior in yesteryears. It really helped me last time. When I ran a, the half marathon in Brighton, no, sorry, was it? No, Bristol, actually. I went in, I did the half marathon in Chippenham. I'm going to say this was 2017. And um, one of the things that really helped me, because I remember... I ran the Barcelona half marathon the same year. And I remember for that marathon, I did like the standard program. I did like a Hal Higdon, you know, eight week, 12 week program where you're essentially just running as many miles as you can in consecutive days during the week with some additional, you know, sprint kind of relay sort of stuff. It's mostly just getting your mileage up. And I did that and I was okay when I did the Barcelona marathon, but don't get me wrong. Um, I did kind of get caught off guard because it's really hilly in uh, parts of Barcelona or in a route that we were basically taking. And um, it was really hot. So I was kind of dying on that route. But I managed to finish it, I think, in about 147 and then one, one hour 47 minutes. And then fast forward to the Chippenham half marathon in the middle of Bristol. Again, scorching hot weather, especially when we started running throughout the countryside. Because, you know, this little, I'm assuming Chippenham is just a town outside of Bristol. I think it's, sorry, I think it is anyway. Don't, um, uh, don't take my word for it, but I'm pretty sure it's a little town just outside of Bristol. And um, it's just lovely, isn't it? It's super scenic. It just reminds you of, you know, some period drama that you might have watched um, in yesteryears. But um, of course, with those kind of locations, there's no sort of, um, there's no high rise buildings to give you any sort of shade, no big trees. You're just kind of, you know, exposed to the elements. And of course, I just had a vest on with some shorts. I hadn't put any sunscreen on because I've got that ignorant, uh, you know, stupid uh, um, sort of infantile way of thinking where I think black people don't get sunburnt. When I need to remember, I, I might be black, but I'm not African black. Do you know what I mean? My skin hasn't been exposed to melanin um, or to sunlight in that. Oh, yeah. My skin hasn't been um, exposed to UV rays in that kind of um, um, intensity for a very long time especially since most of my adult life has been spent living in the UK right dreary and dreaded so I was getting absolutely burned I was dying but what I did realize when I did that half marathon in Chippenham 
doing the power of speed and endurance protocol or this you know the power of speed and endurance protocol yeah by Brian McKenzie what I realized is that I was able to be a lot more stronger and I was able to sustain or yeah to basically sustain my pace for longer periods of time because you know if you've run before you'll know even if you do a 5k you know you might start off the blocks really quickly and then you kind of you know slow down and start to gather your breath you start to run a bit labored you start dragging your feet and then towards the end you start to maybe pick up your pace right it's just a standard thing with running it is what it is and until you get to like the elite level of running you're always going to have that kind of low up and down but you just try and keep yourself within a sort of like a uh, a ratio right of course yeah a sort of a range you want to be between let's say ideally i'd want to be between 7 30 7 minutes 30 seconds per mile to about the slowest 8.30, right? You want to be within that kind of range. And then, of course, when you start getting quicker, you can then start decreasing those times. But I did realize when I did power speed and endurance, I was able to maintain my pace for a long, long period of time. And again, considering the conditions, considering how um, windy and... No, well, not windy. The roads weren't windy. Let me take it back. In Chippenham, the roads were like really... Because it was a countryside, you don't necessarily see the end of the road, right? It just keeps going. You just feel like it, there's no end to it. It's all like running a marathon on a motorway. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a lot... It's a lot... It does it's a lot more grueling psychologically than it is to run it in an area that you know or you're familiar with or like in a city or something or like in a park because you're running on a predetermined route you can kind of you know your brain is telling you you know there's going to be a finish line up and coming but when you're just running on the road it's super difficult I found the same thing uh, the same difficulty when I did when I went to Berlin one year and I took my running shoes the one year I did do that I didn't do it again because you know it's not a good idea you know going to Berlin and getting up to all that kind of nonsense and deciding to go out for a run it's not the best set of ideas I can tell you that especially for your heart so I decided one time to go running and what I realized quite quickly I went to where I, oh yeah I went to the Tempelhof airport or something right it's that park thing it's like an abandoned airport in the middle of um, Berlin it's sort of like next to Neukölln and um, it was really hard running in there because essentially you're running on an you know on an, what's what, what do you call it on a on a runway right on an airport, airport runway is what you're basically running on and you just get so tired because you're not going anywhere and it? it's just so long um the tarmac is super sticky i guess because they have to use it has to be a certain compound to maybe grip the tires i don't know it just felt really weird so um you know i kind of put that to a side but again power speed endurance by brian mckenzie if you're curious about that definitely go check it out if you're a runner out there and you want to have a different way of kind of upping your mileage and upping your um aerobic threshold because you know the, the program essentially um tells you to run you know anywhere between 200 10 200 repeats to 8 um 400 well, no, 8 800 repeats right so you just do a kind of a range in between somewhere there and you obviously you um slip in a couple one minute sorry a couple two mile trial time trials you do some other sort of longer runs but at most you do probably like five miles on one run like most of it's done kind of like you know circuit training in order to kind of build up your anaerobic threshold so that when you do go end up running you've got the base in order to kind of really kick on and i really found it really really helpful um i think of course the mileage for mileage sake people it does work for some people but i think for my um protocol for the stuff i'm doing the fact that i'm doing so much strength stuff and i'm doing so many weights it probably would make more sense to kind of make the running as um as palatable as I can so that I'm making sure I'm doing it. Cause if I'm, you know, wake up in the morning and I've got a five mile run to go to after I've just done, you know, flipping for what 15 uh, squats, really heavy squats the day before, it's gonna be incredibly difficult for me to either get a good workout because my legs will just be completely spent or for me to get out of bed. So uh power speed and endurance has been the way to go. Anyway, um, here we are, man. Welcome back to the show. Glad you could have your company. Grab yourself a drink. I've got myself a nice jug of water, you know, sober October vibes. Nice and clean, nice and fresh. I wonder if there's a difference in the way that I talk sometimes on this podcast. Um, like now, if I kind of go back and look at the other episodes from like, you know, prior to October, if there's a clear um, difference in my um, uh, mental capacity or my ability to uh, speak. <laughs> probably not I'm, I'm assuming probably i'm probably worse for wear but i assume waking up with a hangover and recording the podcast probably um isn't the best way to go about doing such a thing but who knows maybe maybe there's a difference maybe there isn't but regardless i'm drinking a nice jug or jar actually of water at the moment so grab yourself a drink uh grab yourself a snack whatever you're doing right now and let's get in the show so much to talk about so much to cover so much to cover so Report number one, interesting news to report on. Um, 
I, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, Donald Trump got COVID and didn't get COVID. He, he, he recovered in record time, two days. For some reason, no one really cares about whether or not if he's, um, if he's contagious. Um, he's decided to, um, what well, I guess he decided to, but they're obviously saying that he didn't discharge himself. But, you know, with conversation with his doctor, they decided it'd probably be best that he go back to the White House. And I guess um, it's just a unique set of experiences, right? He's got COVID during an election year. Um, he's been very boastful about his um, his potential of winning it. He's spoken about, obviously, you know, the rigged uh, ballot ballot uh, elections, what ballot votes, or whatever it may be called. So he's obviously on edge about, you know, about the election coming up. He doesn't feel as confident as he might have maybe felt in the past. Actually, he wasn't even confident in 2016. I think he thought he wasn't going to win anyway. But regardless, it's a unique set of experiences, but it still doesn't leave the American public feeling that confident in their leader and feeling as if like he's got a good handle on the issue, right? You want to, you just want to set a good example, isn't it? That's what you want to do. Fair enough if he's okay. Fair enough if, he, if he's got world-class flipping uh, medical care. Fair enough if he's just one of the rare people who got COVID and nothing really happened, right? Because there are those cases that do exist. There are some people out there who are still having um, some uh, mental issues. Some people are still having some um, sensory issues. You know, the, the, their sense of smell hasn't come back. Back. Um, some people, the sense of taste hasn't come back. Some people are still suffering from fatigue. But there are those that exist who do get COVID, test positive, have no symptoms. And if as long as they quarantine and they test again, they're usually pretty okay to kind of continue on with life. Now, of course, we don't know if there's long term issues that are going to lay dormant and then arise later on. But for the most part, that does exist. So Trump could be one of those people. But considering his age, considering the fact that he only eats fast food, considering that he's, you know, quite overweight or, you know, obese, for, I guess, for his height in terms of uh, BMI and stuff, it just didn't make any sense. But again, hey, ho, you know what it is. He's got the best care. He got out of hospital, fair enough. But then the one person who I thought would would really, really suffer when he got COVID was Chris Christie. And he announced that he got it himself and then it basically admitted himself to hospital without, you know, much uh, kickback. And this is a report here from NBC New York stating the fact that says, report, Chris Christie knocked back, not knocked down. It says, former New Jersey governor Chris Christie knocked up or not knocked down while hospitalized with coronavirus, the Star Ledger reported on Monday. Newspaper economist Tom Moran reported he spoke to the former JP governor for 10 minutes ago um, and Chris Christie sounded carousey but didn't want to talk about details about his health or his treatment, according to the article, which is, which is understandable, right? You should be able to keep your, um, you know, your health issues private. But it's just funny. It's just funny considering that, again, the Republicans, it seemed that from the outside were the ones that were saying it wasn't that big of a deal, which who knows? It might not be a big deal. It might not be a big deal in context, right? Once you start to kind of um, get more information regarding the virus. And unfortunately, it looks like one of those viruses that some people have to pass away just so you can gain a better understanding of it. Some people have to come close to death in order to get a better understanding of it. That may be the case. But the way they treated it beforehand, the way they sort of um, were very resistant to any kind of, um, you know, restrictions in the economy me the way they're resistant to any kind of freedom of movement is really really odd but obviously makes sense considering it's america considering um, um how highly they hold uh their freedom of choice and all that malarkey right they're, they're a very um independent nation in that regard right even though they're all kind of together in one place they sort of all have their own rules you know own states own individuals very i won't say individualistic but it's quite that's that's the duality of america it's quite patriotic and it's also individualistic individual individualistic that's the word, right? <laughs> On the same page. But anyway, um, so I understand his need not to kind of divulge it, but it does, you know, it does come across a bit weird that everybody that's got it within the Republican Party so far has been reluctant to share any details regarding their treatment. When you do think to yourself, if people on the left hand, if the left people on the left, people on the Democrat side were, um, you know, had contracted coronavirus to this extent, they would be going ham on them on, on Twitter, or on social, on TV and stuff. You know that would happen. Anyway, it says here, Christie said the virus is scary, of course, and that he is prime target given his weight and history of asthma, which is very, very true, right? <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, yeah, shit, Chris Christie is that really massive rotunda guy, isn't it? And then I remember the epic images of him playing baseball again, not fat shaming or anything, just, you know, again, observation and just, you know, sharing a bit of a chuckle in that regard. But God damn it, man. Like, if ever there was a living, breathing example of a uh, alpha male American man, this is it, right? The, the their idea of what alpha males look like in america right are either former navy seals or people that look like this 
And usually people that look like this that walk around schlubby, has his slacks all the way past his belly button, um, you know, has really horrible sandals on. They're usually the guys that, you know, you never know, you know, who owns bloody, you know, GM Motors or something, or he owns, or he's the guy, or he's he's the heir to the throne of a family that invented the bolts that go on the bottom of your sink or some shit like that, right? So that like, they've got wealth upon wealth, so you can't necessarily talk to them, but God almighty, that body is just like all the way nasty, isn't it? There's just nothing. I've never actually seen a man with like that pouch. Because, you know, that's the one thing that women tend to have a bit of an issue with, right? The pouch. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's a hormonal thing. Um, it's a big issue uh, with women, you know, in terms of um, working out, in terms of periods. I'm assuming in terms of when you have a baby also, getting rid of that little bit there at the bottom. Um, obviously, my, again, I have no idea why that is personally, but I guess it must be something hormonal. But I've never seen that, you know, kind of pouch thing on a guy like that. It's just kind of epic to see, isn't it? It's really, really bizarre. But again, big up to him for being so comfortable in what he wears and comfortable in his, his own skin. Same as like a Burt Kreischer, right? In his head, he thinks he looks like, I don't know, he thinks he looks like Russell Westbrook. Do you know what I mean? Like, there is no, there is no uh, shame in his game in that regard. But then the other thing that I remember Chris Christie about was this epic story. Do you remember this, right? This is from, uh, when was this? I think 2017. Yeah, 2017, this flipping epic, epic, epic story of Chris Christie decided to shut down a beach in New Jersey, um, his state. Um, I don't know why. I'm going to read the article for a reason. Right? He shut it down for some unspecified reason. And then he was photographed, like, enjoying the beach that he shut down for her, whatever reasons that he shut it down for. And as his article says, he was unrepentant. So this is the article. It says, Chris Christie bold, uh, boldly soaks up rays on beach as he, he shuts the public. It says, um, even for the U.S. state governor with six months left in office, an approval rating of just 15%. That's flipping horrendous, isn't it? Um, and again, you know, typical. I've been there before being a former fat guy, isn't it? Being on the beach, essentially fully clothed with a T-shirt, shorts and a hat on is mad. First, you order the government. First, you order the government to shut down uh, that, clo that closes all the state parks and beaches on the eve of the 4th July holiday weekend, right? That's one statement. And then secondly, then you take a police helicopter to the coast and spend a good chunk of Sunday soaking up the rays of your family on a prime pristine stretch of sand that thanks to your order, you entirely have to yourself. However, the New Jersey governor, Chris Christie, was unrepentant. Asked about the reports that his family was staying on the stateside residence in the beach state park while his, the, the place was closed to public. Christie first denied he had benefited and said, I didn't get any son what a fucking cock and again it's interesting though i wish someone could make a case study for this especially maybe if it maybe applies to the tories but i don't think it does because i think a lot of working class people here have a lot of you know um are very much against this current tory government they might yeah they might regard themselves as tories or they might you know support the tory party but this actual government that's in charge at the moment now they probably don't have any good things to say about them but I'm really intrigued if somebody, it would be really amazing if somebody in the future would make a documentary or something along the lines or some sort of podcast or whatever it may be, detailing how the Republicans, especially the Republicans of this era, the modern era of Republicans, right, the post Tea Party Republicans, how they've somehow managed to convince working class people that they're fighting for them. Like, how did they do that? Like, these guys are like, imagine, this is Chris Christie's home in Jersey, right? Probably one of his homes. Like, it's a beach, what, what do they call it? Beachfront home mansion for the most part with a separate outhouse here mass amounts of parking and legitimately it's a couple of you know when you go in airbnbs and you book an airbnb in a lavish location somewhere and it says oh two minutes away from the beach and you get there and it's like flipping a 10 minute walk or a five minute or a five minute cab ride this is legitimately a two minute walk to the beach right christine blue seas right amazing 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 and again i'd imagine unless you're living on the west coast um it's pretty difficult to get to beaches in the u.s right especially if you're landlocked so he's in a prime location but somehow he represents a party that has somehow managed to convince the working class or the people even the middle class right that they have somehow fighting for their um fighting for their benefit how do they do that i really am curious again if, if i'm many of my, of my commentators are a little bit uh, more politically savvy than i am when it comes to u.s politics please let me know in the comments like, how did the republican party convince the working class or the middle class for that regard that they were fighting for them because it doesn't make any sense because this guy isn't right he shut down a beach <laughs> and then decides to enjoy it himself not setting any precedent not taking any accountability again it's it's another it's another it's another kind of example you see of it's kind of um uh, similar to Trump's uh, leadership, right? Where you just lead how you lead a company. Whereas if you're leading a nation, it's completely different, right? When you lead a company, you probably can be a bit of a dick and just do what you want and sort of like not 
necessarily you can you can you can if you're leading a company i can assume some uh, obviously i think the great the great ceos the ones that go down in history as you know being some of the most influential some of the most important leaders of our time they obviously wouldn't do this but i can i do think if you are a if you are a bit of a cock and you do want to be a bit of a wanker you probably can get away with just you know being a dick to your staff members and then just doing the bare minimum in order to make sure your company is functional right you don't need to uh, setting a good example if anything you know that's not your job in it that's not your role maybe you leave that to your other um subordinates or line managers that work underneath you but as a leader you probably need to do it but when you're working in politics and you're representing your constituents um you have to somehow set a good example in it right just just in general not even like a oh i'm not i'm gonna abstain from this and you know virtue signaling but just you know if you look it for the public you'd assume you, it looks it locked down for you as well but it didn't he said here yeah, um told of the existence of aerial photos the governor dressed in shorts and a t-shirt sitting on the beach with his wife mary his son andrew and other family members his spokesman brian murray it's funny right um conceded chris christie was on the beach briefly so he said he wasn't on the beach he didn't get any son and then he's 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 um both person saw it and said he was on there briefly madness but murray insisted he didn't get any sun he was wearing a baseball cap oh my god on saturday chris christie um once uh, the darling of the republican party considered a top contender for the presidency had defended his use of the residence he says that's the way it goes he remarked run for governor and you have the residence okay so that's residence that you get as a governor of new jersey okay cool and again even more so why you shouldn't be on that beach setting in a good example jesus these people are unscrupulous isn't it um on sunday he tried another tact the residence was where my family was sleeping he said so that's where i sleep facing him to criticism on monday he insisted he was simply sticking to the privacy announced holiday plans the media had caught a politician keeping his word christie said i that new jersey had a 120 miles of beaches so no one should be deprived but you closed them though the governor's popularity has peaked <laughs> at more than seven percent when he was elected a second term four years ago and he won widespread praise when he was handing of hurricane sandy or oh, i remember that and then somehow um, but they plummeted after they emerged that his then aides had played a key role in the scandal of the lane closures in George Washington Bridge and have fallen even further since he was pulled out of the US presidential race in February last year and endorsed Trump. So that's actually a good thing for once, right? He didn't get, um, his popularity didn't sink because of a scandal because sometimes I think politicians, maybe, especially the, the unscrupulous ones, right? They deserve their day in court, quote unquote, right? So he didn't get brought down by a scandal or anything salacious. He got brought down because he, he was responsible for putting in place shitty policies that negatively affected, you know, parts of the American public, right? That's a good thing. You want your politicians to go out that way so that he knows he's always disgraced, which is why you don't really hear much about him, right? He kind of whimpers in the corner, makes some statements here and there, but he usually keeps his head down because he knows, you know, most for the most part, people don't really rate him. But God almighty, what a dude, isn't it? And this guy has COVID now at the moment. Uh, it says, so it comes back to the COVID article. It says, Christy um, called um, Rub to, uh, called to rub Moran's nose in a mistake he had made stemming from Christie's 2012 visit in Jordan according to the newspaper so for now folks let's not worry too much the man is knocked back but he's not no okay oh, cool he's talking about Moran okay fair enough um, Andrew Christie the former governor's son who works in the scouting for New York Met said his father co remains in COVID isolation for a room in the hospital and is doing well Christie announced Saturday morning that he tested positive the day after Donald Trump for his own diagnosis he was with the president at, for the debate for the debate prep in Cleveland on Tuesday and at the Rose garden event where trump named judge amy coney barrett as a pick for supreme court on December 26 later saturday christie said that he had gone to hospital for precautionary re reasons including his history of asthma imagine having asthma and going to an event in general and not wearing a face mask even if you're on out if you know if you're outdoors it's just some so many people are just like so reckless with their health which is okay i think that's okay i'm gonna say i think that's fine i think we've got enough information at the moment that we should not be spending time trying to convince or educate people who don't want to be educated or convinced in any kind of way or shape or form i think you're allowed to decide hey i'm i would rather get it and live my life and you're you're also allowed to hunker down at home and you know not go outside and order everything through postmates or uber eats you're allowed to do either one i think that's fine enough and then of course if you contract the virus or if you are, you know, if, if you didn't turn psychotic from staying indoors, you have to live with the consequences. That's it. I just don't want to hear people complaining about it, right? Or saying, oh, I told you so. It's like, no, you didn't tell them anything. He was never going to change his way, right? Imagine being, you know, extreme, what, what's your feeling? Extremely obese as Chris Christie is, having asthma and whatever other ailments that he might have being, you know, being that size. Because I know having, being a form of fatty myself, other ailments that kind of come along with it. 
and also not taking COVID seriously. You just, you know, you've only got yourself to blame in that regard. So it is what it is. And then to make matters even more interesting, right? To make matters more, 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 more interesting. Uh, <laughs> where is it? This guy, not sure if you're familiar with him, but boom, boom, boom. This guy, Stephen Miller, former White House aide, has now contracted COVID himself. He saw like a pantomime villain of politics in the USA. I just remember him having some epic, epic interviews. And I'm going to get one of a compilation of his interviews here so you can get an introduction of what Stephen Miller is about <laughs> and why some people might not, um, why some people are probably not paying praying for his recovery as they were kind of battling with their conscience regarding Trump. I don't think it's the same sort of rationale as happening with Stephen Miller. But here's Stephen Miller in case you don't know who he is. Saying, Wait a minute. That's different than saying you can't. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Hope to the world. Yeah. Uh, don't, no, don't be condescending, Jay. Jay. Steven. <laughs> White House advisor Steve Miller has battled the media and his coverage of President Trump. He, yeah, he he loves Trump. He's like one of those lapdogs. Like, fair enough, you're like a staunch... I, I get it if you're a staunch Republican and you just have to, you know, support the guy that's in the White House, support the guy that's leading your party. It is what it is. You just have to fall in line. But he really... I think he's like... You know those people that had quite fringe ideas in the Republican Party anyway and now they see Trump and he's sort of like their kind of you know their Trojan horse to sort of push in some of their more fringe ideas the ideas that maybe aren't you know necessarily the um, uh, the most politically correct ideas to say in that regard right they're still maybe politically sound in some respects but they're not politically correct in some way shape or form but yeah he he's his affection for Trump is knows no bounds and some would argue that he probably might he might be more of a favor of Trump's than Trump's own children actually especially some of his sons here are three examples of Stephen Miller's fiery exchanges with the press condescending as you want as part of your mo but listen and again stop, stop it again i don't actually i don't actually mind him when he gets back with jim acosta because i think jim acosta can be a bit of a tosser in it in that regard um you know he he is kind of um he kind of gives me the impression that he kind of wants to be the star of the show right um which is super annoying in that regard but the other the other exchanges that he has are just like it's just imagine being Imagine having any interest in politics in the US and then turning on your TV and seeing, you know, people, you know, a host of a supposed impartial uh, show on the news grilling the guy in this way. And then, of course, the guy getting grilled, being so combative, it's just not conducive to a good discussion about politics whatsoever. Have 24 seven. I, I have no idea why you you're attacking have, me. Well, I'll my, explain my, to my, you. My yeah, point I'll, is, I'll tell you why I'm attacking Steve Bannon, you. Steve Bannon, Steve Bannon, Bannon, I'll tell you why I'm shitting on you. <laughs> the president's travel ban. He helped, I, he helped I'm, pull, pull I'm out. I'm so glad you brought that up. Because just, that's one of the fake news Steven, items in the book. Steve, oh yeah, that's the, he's, he's the orchestrator of the travel ban. About how the travel ban was written. Let me. Steve Bannon didn't push the travel ban. If you would let me. Steve Bannon would let me. If you let me ask this question. No, because you have 24 hours of negative anti-Trump hysterical coverage on this network that led in recent weeks to some spectacularly think, embarrassing false reporting. I think the from viewers your right now can ascertain no, the viewers hysterical. are entitled my, to have my, three months of the truth. Why don't you just give me three minutes to tell you the truth about Donald Trump that I know? Jim, have you honestly, Jim, have you honestly <laughs> never met? That was a pretty... <laughs> He's a mad guy. He's a mad guy. Let's see if we guess Jim Acosta. At a, an immigrant from another country who speaks English outside of Great Britain and Australia? Is that your personal experience? Oh, you got to have a good strong But that's not what you said. And it shows it shows your cosmopolitan bias. And I just want to say... Like engineer the and racial say, and ethnic flow of people into this country. Yeah, this that policy. is one of the most outrageous, insulting, ignorant, and foolish things you've ever said. He might have, he, he might have legitimately one of the most punchable faces in the world. He looks both really young and really old. He saw like Benjamin Button like caught in the, I mean, he's, yeah, he saw like Benjamin Button that's sort of like caught in purgatory. He doesn't know which way he's going to go, isn't it? It's sort of confusing. He's got an old man face, but then young man skin, but then he's got old man hair and he's got old man eyes. And then he's got old man views or something. Right? He, he, he's got like the kind of really odd fringe um, views that you'd kind of attribute to somebody really old in age, right? Somebody that's sort of seen a lot of things, been a lot of places and they've just summarized, you know what? I don't like them Jews. I don't like them immigrants, right? He's got that kind of opinion of him, but he's really young. He's like 32 or something. I think he might be, yeah, he's probably a little bit older now. At the time, I remember him, him being about 32. But some of his exchanges on interviews on, online were just... They were a box office, man. It was so intriguing just to watch somebody, you know, that's meant to be a White House aide, essentially sparring uh, for the president on the president's behalf with some of the, you know, news anchors on some of these news shows in America. Is that our opponents, the media, and the whole world will opponents <laughs> begin to take action 
Well, wait till you unite the country. Our country are very substantial and will not be questioned. And that danger will be eliminated because of some enforcement action that we are going to take in the coming days. And that's something we should celebrate, not criticize. The power of the president to exclude aliens in the national interest. But they, they say, did not even, they say they did that not the even courts have a long that. history of reviewability the courts, the, here. No. Our All right. emphasis is on deporting and removing criminal aliens who pose a threat to public safety. But he, the funny thing about him too, he's like the guy in the TV series where he's the really weaselly, dweeby, sort of like backstabby, snaky guy that's essentially um, responsible. And, you know, he's an architect of chaos in that regard, right? But he always manages to survive, right? He's like little finger that never dies. That's what he is. So he looks dweeby. He looks like, you know, essentially if you, if you touched him or if you sat the back of his head, you know, you might essentially sprain his neck. But he could legitimately, legitimately have you buried. Allegedly, I'd imagine so. Right? Again, this is me talking hypothetically. I don't know anything. Please don't come after me, CIA. But I would imagine so. Right? He can press a button. He can put a few calls in and you wouldn't see your mum again. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> legitimately. So big up Stephen Miller, I say. <laughs> yeah, well, soon. I don't want no smoke. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, next on the list. We've got so many things to get through. So many things to get through. What are we gonna do now? Okay, cool. Let's go on. Let's move on. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, good news. Good news. Good news. Um, Dogface, my guy Dogface, you remember Dogface, right? The guy that um went viral with his uh skateboarding clip of himself drinking a bit of what's that what's that drink called again? Highland Spring, Highland Springs, whatever that raspberry beverage is that looks flipping delicious skateboarding down the street having a good time enjoying himself he has now right got the attention of the ceo of the company the, the of the drink that he was basically drinking and the ceo decided to turn up to his residence and bless him with a truck do you know how amazing that is he blessed him with a flipping truck and if i can find the actual video itself here let me see it it's just guys got a video of him so this is the this is the video of him receiving the truck here where is it Ba, ba, ba. This is his TikTok. Let's go that one. Ba, ba, ba. Oh, there we go. This is him driving the car. Look at this. Look how amazing that is. Look how amazing that is. So yes, yeah, so a big up dog face, man. In terms of actually, you know, feeling uh, a little bit of a good feeling, a bit of good vibes during this, you know. It's a Crazy times we're living in at the moment. I'll take that off in case I get copyright strike. But yeah, there we go, man. Dogface is driving in his brand new Nissan pickup truck given to him by the CEO of Ocean Sp of Ocean Spray. That's a drink that he's drinking, Ocean Spray. So big up Dogface, man. Much, 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 much deserved. And again, a good thing all around regardless. Let's see what it says here. What's this? It's a Justin Bieber song. There were too many. Oh God. Yeah, there's too many, too many copyright songs here. But let's just see him. He's pick up a phone with his skateboard. Next to his truck, of course, having a good time. Yeah, so big up that guy, man. What an absolute legend. Um, another good example as to us trying to get the most out of life, even if we are going through this terrible time we're going through at the moment, let's make the best of it. Because if Dogface is having a smile on your face, skating around his longboard, chilling, vibing, we can do the same thing too. We can do the same thing too. Okay, moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on. Okay, another, another, another ra ra ranchy, raunchy, 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 another raunchy, no, another interesting anti masker decides to put themselves front and center again because this is a thing I'm just confused about. I'm utterly confused. These anti maskers, right, they seem to be very, um, eager to get themselves in front of a camera and tell people exactly why they're refusing to wear a mask for some unbeknown reason i don't know why whenever they get up in front of the camera they always embarrass themselves they're never articulate they never have any succinct points it's always nonsense that they're spouting right it's conspiratory non nonsense stuff that would make QAnon proud and they're sitting there speaking boldly about their claims about something you know and, and it's interesting because these are the same people who had no idea COVID even existed prior to COVID-19 transporting itself from Wuhan over into the shores of the US and now suddenly they've become virologists overnight and they want to let everybody know and this is another example of said thing again free speech and all that right say what you want but god damn it sometimes it's better to let the experts speak but regardless this anti mask decided to speak about her um, <laughs> experience with discrimination uh, being an anti masker 
Okay, so I just wanted to share some of my experience with you, what it's been like um, being an unmasked individual in Johnson County. This why is she why is she doing it in, par in parentheses or in in quotation marks like summer? Uh, I could say a lot about my time in Johnson County this summer. Not oh, she read a poem, mask, she, she, which is she brought a medium post with her and read it out loud. <laughs> it's my choice as a free individual, but I'll boil it down to one point, which is discrimination. <laughs> it has nothing to do with a virus. <laughs> it has everything. <laughs> she couldn't be any more whiter, man. Not again, not to be that guy, but she couldn't be any more whiter. She's like Michigan white, right? She's like flipping, you know, yeah, she's Michigan white. Look at her. She blends in with a flipping, you know, with everything that she's wearing. She probably got on what? Let's let's assume what trainer she's wearing. Not New Balances, um, not Asics. What's she wearing? She got boots on. Has she got slippers. Does she have a pair of Birkenstocks? Yeah, she's probably a Birkenstock wearer, right? Crusty Birkenstock wearers. Um, her feet haven't had any care and attention in them in years. She probably hikes in those Birkenstocks. Jesus Christos. Discrimination. Discrimination. And at the end, the funny thing again at the start of the video, right? Um, freedom to choose, right? Cool. You're free not to wear a mask. But then when you come into my private place of business, such as a supermarket, such as a, you know, whatever, a salon, a gym, then you have to abide my right, my rules. And if my rules require you to wear a mask, just wear it. So that's the, again, that's the thing as well. I don't have a problem with these anti-maskers. Do what you want to do. You guys are psychos, but whatever. Live your life, innit? We're all going through this crazy thing together. Some people have decided to stay on one side of the fence. Cool, do your thing. But it's this desire to somehow make everybody be an anti-masker as well. That's very, very bizarre. So you're saying it's your freedom of choice not to wear it. But then when you come into my place of business, I tell you, you have to wear one to be in here. You then say I'm discriminating against you. Make it make sense thing to do with how we treat one another. I am discriminated against every single day in my county now. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, 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 madam, welcome, right? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Immigrants the world over are looking at you and saying, congratulations for being so bold and welcome to our side. I'm told, stand back. Stand back. Oh, that's the worst you're getting, right? Stand back. No one's following you around the shop. You're not getting beaten up. You're not getting chased out of areas. You're not getting spat on. You're not getting made lewd comments about if you walk up to a certain place with a certain individual on your arm. None of that's happening to you. You're not getting pulled over consistently. You're not getting harassed, <laughs> right? Someone's putting their flipping hand out of you. Stand back. Stop. Don't move. What? <laughs> you don't care about other people. You can't come in here. Ma'am, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. If ever there was a Karen, isn't it? She's, everything in her face is small. Small mouth, small nose, small eyes. Just beady, looking through flipping blinds, calling neighbours, I mean, calling the police about your barbecue. It's not to code. Like, guys, she's really young too. That's the thing too. Imagine being this, um, uh, this stiff, this boring, this um, lacking in, you know, je ne sais quoi at that age. God damn you, woman. You have to wear a mask. Okay, this medium post is mad. One. Leave. <laughs> so I can't get my avocado on toast. <laughs> I can't get my triple maca coco coco maca maca diki loco locho mache lache loto. Get out of here, this woman. I'm treated. We are treated worse than second class citizens. Oh, I thought she was going to go for the juggle and say, we are treated worse than blacks. Oh, that would have been mad. She's not with it. She's not with it. you got to say it with your chest. you got to say it with your chest. <laughs> we're treated like we're not even human. Okay, here we go. Other here we go. Someone's fellow American. Uh-huh. I'll just tell you an example. Oh, yesterday, she didn't go for it. She's not, she's not bad at life. She's not bad at life. Day, but yesterday, I went to mail. Every day of her life, she's been discriminated against, right? Every day of her life, this this um, spectacularly white young lady from middle America or wherever she's from has been discriminated against all her life. All her life, she's faced just obstacles. Firstly, for being a woman. Firstly, for being white. Firstly, for not wearing a mask. Firstly, for wearing dirty Birkenstocks. And lastly, for not shaving her armpits. Discrimination, discrimination, discrimination. Mail package at my local FedEx Kinko's. Walk in. 
set the package down on the counter, politely ask for a scan and a receipt. <laughs> Boring! Stand back. Get back. Right there. Move. Stand back. Move. Move back. Purple dot on the ground. Stand on the purple dot. Okay. Okay. So He's I did. Good girl. Scan the package. Uh -huh. the receipt. Uh huh. Didn't put the receipt on the same counter. This is boring. Sorry. Come on, on, man. Put it over to the side. Oh, so I had side. to walk around. <gasps> you should have walked around. <laughs> as to avoid him as he retreated from his register as I approached. Like I'm some sort of. Hold on. She's, so she's not even complaining about being discriminated against for not wearing a mask. She's complaining about the regulations that are in place in terms of social distancing. And whatever protocols, whatever establishment that you go into has when it comes to dealing with customers and people that are coming into your store. Huh? I thought she was complaining about not having to wear a mask. She's complaining about having to stand on a stop and having to, what, put her receipt around somewhere else and put the box, I'm guessing, in Kinko's through another window. God almighty, the entitlement. And this is, this is our community now. This is the division that has been created by you guys allowing these. I have no idea what to say. I'm actually legitimately lost for words. She's complaining not about being an anti-masker. She's complaining about the restrictions that are in place for COVID. Like, is she not aware that hundreds and thousands of people have died? I think in the world it's probably at a million. I'm pretty sure it's just past a million. Yes, it may not be as serious as you think. Yes, you may think it's the flu. But for now... We're all going to pretend like it's a serious thing. Then once it's over, or once it kind of delves, dies down, then you can kind of pipe up and say all your conspiratory nonsense, right? Because there might be some truth to it. That's what I'm saying. That's the interesting part of it. Now probably isn't the time to uh, make such a hard stance uh, regarding how you think uh, business should be conducted or how the economy should be opened up in some regard, right? I think in some cases people should be saying more things, but I think generally for the bare minimum, just for the bare minimum, just what that required you having to wear a mask and stand on a flipping spot, just do the thing. No one cares what you have to, what you think regarding that. Just do that, that one thing. Then of course, if there's certain industries and sectors that you're involved in that you think that you can maybe have an insight with and say, hey, actually I think this place shouldn't be locked down because of what's going on, blah, blah, blah. Then fair enough, speak up. But God almighty, complaining about having to stand on the dot. The entitlement is so amazing. Again, that's why I know she's not really black because black people aren't that entitled. We don't, we don't have that, right? Immigrants in general can't be that entitled, right? Your whole life is spent trying to... Uh, just get by trying to keep your head above water trying to compete um trying to just survive trying to provide right that's all your life is you have no time to be entitled you really have no time like you might flex around your friends and shit but in general you just head to the grindstone or you just you know you're a bit of a you're a bit of a lazy lout but for the most part you have no time to get up in front of your you know your local council and complain you have to stand the door and hand the receipt to the guy around the corner and he told me to stop with his palm of his hand and as you know in the ancient languages the palm to your hand is very disrespectful it's like what the fuck is she talking about absolute psycho absolute psycho again covid is bringing out the best in people as you can see the best moving on moving on moving on we have an interesting um interview clip here from the no jumper hosted by adam 22 where he interviewed black china this is a clip from complex ambition so big up those guys i follow them on youtube they have probably one of the best um you know music reaction channels out there they're very passionate about the thing they sometimes get some celebrity guests to pop in like the interview that they had in the back seat with trippy red was a legendary moment considering how much they care about his music and it was also good to see trippy red be such a good sport when it comes to talking to those guys so definitely check out complex ambition if you haven't on youtube and on any other platform that they may be on but i also follow them on twitter they do a good job of kind of you know um, aggregating and putting together some of the news concerning hip-hop stuff that's going on so uh, Black China sat down with Adam22 and the interview got a bit tetchy, so much so that she decided to walk out. And um, I have to be honest, I am somewhat in agreement with her. Now, again, I haven't seen the full interview. Um, I've not watched the entire thing. But being a big fan of No Jumper, being a big fan even of Adam22 and what he's basically done with that um, entire platform, it is quite concerning to see where he's kind of like perched upon like he's sort of like in a weird precarious position it sort of feels like to me that he hasn't decided whether he's a shock jock 
or whether he's a legitimate hip hop interviewer. And in my experience, or from my um, what I would like to see from the guy, because I think he's a really valuable voice in hip hop. I think what he's done for the young kids coming up, just providing a platform in general that you know, just providing a platform where the lil the lils of this world, um, the youngs of this world, and all the other coloured haired, um, you know, um, bedazzled denim wearing rappers can go and speak. He's been has been amazing, right? He deserves props for that, regardless, right? That. Uh, XXX Tentation interview will go down in history. He's had some epic moments on that, you know, from flipping, what's his face? From, um, what's his name? John Gabbana nodding off numerous times to the countless salacious, you know, exposés from, you know, what's her name? Selena Powell and those were like, he's had some legendary moments on there, but more importantly, he's provided a platform for young up and coming hip hop artists to say their piece and to essentially, you know, um, create a bit of a time capsule for them in, in terms of their career, right? Especially when you look back at some of the previous episodes, you see a more, you know, chunkier version of Adam 22 in a more dilapidated setting, talking to these rappers with one camera and then you see where they sort of evolved to now it's quite nice to see where it's happening but obviously because i don't know what's happened i guess maybe he just wants to take these platforms to the next level he seems to be um kind of purposely courting controversy or just purposely put himself in positions that are not necessarily beneficial to his long-term prospects you know one of those um positions might have effectively given deciding to give Selena Power a show on his platform considering how reckless she is with uh the names of the people that she allegedly deals with and what that might do in general considering you know you know hip-hop is a small industry like any subculture right most of the most of the women in that subculture get passed around by lack of a, a better term you know more often than not so probably a lot of women in that industry or in that scene in general hold a lot of the secrets of the scene but in general they sort of keep their cards close to their chest they keep the gossip between their friends or you know they just don't tell anyone right they're all adults and they continue doing their thing but for um seeing the power to get up on this platform and essentially out some of the more prominent people who sometimes have some deeper connections to the industry that you're in than you actually realize i'd imagine especially when you look at someone like an obj right there are probably some people like effectively having a selena power on there and having us say what happened with her and obj or no not her what's his face uh what's his name ba, 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 ba. what's his name chief keys baby mother right having her on there saying what she said about obj and whatever it may be allegedly what happened between them you would be lead you it would be easy to assume that obj being a big of a star and athlete that he is at the moment that he probably has that's probably going to upset a lot more people than adam 22 would have probably realized and he's probably going to close a lot more doors in the future than he probably realized and of course he's got his own issues to deal with too those other prior allegations that are always hanging over his head so i just kind of would imagine especially being a, a fan of his i would just hope that he would be acknowledging especially being in media right he'd know that there are people out there who are kind of hoping that he fucks up so that they can bury him and cancel him so anything that he does that's kind of out of step that's sort of um you know that can get sort of pulled up people are gonna make a you know turn a mountain into moho and this might be a good example of it right so you sit down with black china and i guess the interview gets really awkward and she decides to walk out and again i don't have a, in a problem with people walking out of interviews i think more artists should do that i think we've you know we've been subjected to too many interviews with hip-hop artists that clearly don't want to be at an interview i'd much rather they just get up and say hey i don't want to do this do you know what i mean you get you get the benefit of it being viral and also the, the hip hop artist gets continued going on about their day and obviously you know for the person that's doing the interview you know you get some epic content that you can obviously spread across your social medias as adam 22 has probably done with this clip but let's play a little bit of it now mm -hmm. are you open to only fans collaborations or any like do you do anything with other people on there no nah. i had safari's only fans i feel like you guys could definitely do a dope collab you what that's what probably set it off wrong, right? And I guess, and again, just, just to be safe to him as well, to be fair, Black China, from what I've seen, reading the comments from Shade Room regarding her reality TV show or some other, I don't know where I was on, I don't know where I was reading it, but from what I've seen of the girls that watch her show, she's not the most entertaining of individuals, right? She's quite chill, quite mellow, probably the opposite of what her kind of physical um form looks like right she probably looks probably like she'd be a little bit more louder than what she is but she's pretty mellow pretty you know even killed um some would say boring some would say she has a personality of a cardboard door or something right but um she's not the best interviewer i would say in that regard unless she probably I guess she's not the best interviewer unless she's on a really big platform. Let's just say that, right? She's on a Hot 97. She's on a breakfast club. She's obviously going to shout out a little bit more because she knows what that can do for her career. But maybe sitting down with M22 was a little bit of a like, ugh, 
Do you know what I mean? It's locked down. We've got nothing to do. Let's get some free promo out there. Let's just go and sit down with this guy, right? She probably doesn't even know who he is in that regard. So that's why she's bringing this energy. So I can understand it. But again, is there some history between her and Safari that we don't know about? Probably. I'm not too sure. But it's probably your job of an interview if you sent somebody getting a bit off put in by the question that you asked to be like, hey, I'm not trying to put some drama out there. I just thought because he's a content creator out there that you guys would be good for a collab. If that's something you don't want to talk about, we can just move on to the next topic. And she's like, yeah, cool, move on. But I guess the way that he kind of was smirking and gigging about it and he obviously, you know, being the guy that he is and being smart and being aware of social media, he was aware this was going to go, this was turning into a train wreck. So maybe he was just driving it, you know, straight into a wall. But God almighty, man, this got awkward really quickly. Safari is killing it on OnlyFans. Right, he's married. Right, but you know, you know, you know, no, that's hook weird. Up. You can don't just play with see? Like post that. up and just look cool together, no, right? No, just don't, like, don't disrespect it, like, <laughs> I don't know, marriage. I don't, no, 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 no. I don't think, I'm not suggesting yeah, anything that she don't. would. See? That's what I'm saying, man. Like, if you're going to be about that shock jock life, right, this is the problem as well. Because look at Charlemagne. Charlemagne pivoted away from that. Char Charlemagne was a piece of shit prior, right, to um, this um, mental health and uh, black men don't cheat and black business thing that he's doing at the moment, right? He was a piece of shit, especially you see the way that he treated um, Logic in the beginning, the way he treated Post Malone, the way he treated countless females that went on that show. Unless you were like a scary trap rapper, right? He didn't really give you any respect and he was always kind of, you know, aiming for the lowest kind of form of humor to just looking for a viral moment. And of course he pivoted on that and used it as a platform to sort of boost his profile and do what he thinks he's doing. So bravo to him. But I don't think that thing is going to run nowadays. It just isn't. And unfortunately as well, optics wise for Adam22 being a white guy, it just doesn't come across well. You just can't do that. You have to either be a serious interviewer or just be Nardwa. You can't be shock shot guy in hip hop because I guess in America, especially, they always view white people in hip hop as a guest, right? You always kind of, uh, people that they sort of, white people are sort of like tolerated in hip-hop right you sort of kind of have to go a long way to kind of earn the respect of some prominent hip-hop artists in uh in america for the most part so when you start trolling or when you start insinuating things or just being cheeky or having this sort of like dry humor with some artists they're just never going to accept it because they always look at you as they look they kind of look at you as the op right that's basically what they look at you as <laughs> like don't be disrespectful <laughs> okay fine <laughs> um have you spoken to soldier boy recently no are you <laughs> no, look, I, I, look at look at She switched. Really <laughs> okay. So you guys had like a thing about a year ago. Did you ever consider doing music with him? Look, look. Okay, guess what? <laughs> yeah. What? I'm out. You're out. <laughs> yeah. The soul's boy question. No, it's just like you keep like being weird. Yeah, exactly. So I imagine the questions before that were weird too. But to be fair to Adam Twenty Two as well, again, not to be rude to Black China, but what questions can you ask her of any sort of merit, really? Right? I guess she's pursuing a musical career. I guess um, it's probably just another avenue for her to kind of, you know, it's probably another revenue stream. It's probably not something. Oh again, yeah, she can you assume that? It's not fair to assume she's not taken seriously. Again, everyone has a right to do whatever they want to have to do. He has a right to ask his questions. She has a right to be offended. Is what it is. But you know, this is what the people want to hear about. You know? Nah, but it's just weird. I'm out. All right. I, I agree with her. <laughs> Damn. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you, Black China. That was a bit cuck at the end, didn't I? I appreciate you. Come on. Like, allow that. So, yeah, that's the thing I have an issue with a little bit, man. Again, I'm a, I'm a fan of Adam 22, but I feel like he's trying way too hard to be um, a shock jock, to be controversial, to get viral moments. And it's coming across really yucky. That's the thing. It's really ruining his product. My opinion only. Again, what do I know? Moving on, we have another interesting clip here uh, taken from a brand new show that's yet to be, I don't know, it's actually launched already. Episode one, I think it's out already uh, from the Joe Budden network, a uh, new network that Joe Budden has effectively launched, I guess, in response to some people kind of assuming that he isn't as big of a mogul as he probably thinks he's in his head and maybe justifying some of the rumors of his 250 million uh, valuation of his podcast uh, with his supposed um, negotiations with Spotify. But one of the first shows that he's kind of debuted viewing um is an episode is a podcast called see the thing is hosted by three young ladies one called olivia one called bridget and another girl called what four court pumps or something like that so is that her name four court pumps yeah or peg the stallion i don't know whatever the name is so let's um look at a clip of it now they're, they're talking about tory lanes 
and they're discussing the release of his album. And again, I have some thoughts regarding this because I think it's a little, it's getting a little bit annoying, right? This sort of view regarding the Tory Lane's album and regarding his issue with Megan Thee Stallion. And I'm going to release some of my comments as we continue watching the video. So I mean, she said it even before all of this kind of like trailed and snowballed. She went on live and said that she never said anything to the police because she was trying to protect a black man Correct. from being slain Correct. or brutalized by the police. Right. And what you just because someone says something doesn't mean it's true, especially when there's two parties involved. You do make an album, throw Kehlani name in there, JoJo name in there. J.R. Right. Smith randomly, but and shout out and shout like, out, shout out. Came okay, that's a weird statement to make. Again, let's just assume, right? This is a thing. I don't know. Where, I don't know whether it's a it's a cognitive disconnect, or if it's a thing that just um. Yeah, is it a cognitive disconnect, or is it a, uh, or is it some kind of weird, um. Yeah, what, what could it be? I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's odd. It's odd that two people could go through something, a situation, quite clearly, right? A very serious situation where allegedly a gun was fired, where allegedly someone was injured by either the result of the gun being fired or being directly shot with the gun in the foot, in the case of Megan and Stallion. And two people have different accounts of this, to have two people have different accounts of what exactly happened. And of course, you know, then the authorities get involved and they didn't have to adjudicate. Um, and get to some kind of, you know, reasonable conclusion as to what actually occurred uh, prior to the said individual getting into the vehicle, what happened in the vehicle, and what happened henceforth, right? But there's two sides to the story. It's just what it is, right? Unfortunately, of course, one person might be telling the truth, but there are two people in this incident, so you have to accept that there's two versions of it. Now, if Tori really believes that he didn't shoot Meg the Stallion, he's perfectly within his rights to say whatever he wants about whoever has gone out on the ledge and said that he did do it when they weren't there. Because I, in my opinion, I think people have the right to bury him and say he's cancelled because of what they heard might have happened. And he also has the right to bury those people and diss them on a the track uh, if in response to what he thinks, what they're saying is basically false, right? They, they all have a right to say what they want to say. Now, does it mean what if he's saying what he's saying that he's somehow um, uh, reducing the severity of the incident? No, because if he clearly thinks that he did nothing wrong, why should he go out of his way to sort of um, walk on eggshells, remain silent, remain stoic, apologize for things that he didn't do just so he can appease the public that weren't even there? That's the issue, right? Because it's essentially an issue that occurred with supposedly three to four people. Right. They have to, of course, account for themselves when the court case goes on. I think it's October 13th or something along those lines. I remember it from the Los Angeles Times article. If that's the case, then we're going to find that the truth rightly or wrongly anyway. So I don't understand why people are so hard on either side, whether it's like Tory's innocent or Tory's guilty. We're going to find out in a, in a week or two. And, and Jojo both for taking a stand. Oh, and also the Jojo and Kalani thing, he's allowed to do that, right? If, if you listen to the album, if his, if his side of the story is true, and he, necessarily, and he kind of thinks that he has a personal relationship with these people and that he thinks that he's owed a phone call. I think that's, I think that's fair enough. I've even said it myself. I think, um, what's, the, what's the one thing that I'm going to say? I think, was it murder? Was it not even murder? It wasn't even murder. Rape is the one. Rape and touching of kids, right? If one of my friends gets accused or is confound guilty, you know, let's say one of my friends is accused of, of touching kids or, or of rape, you know, in my book, from my personal experience, again, you're out, you're deleted, you're done, right? I'm not even, I'm never talking to you again. It is what it is. But if you're accused of, you know, something libelous or something salacious in media, um, you were caught cheating on somebody, you were involved in a really serious or violent fight, um, you know, whatever it may be called, you're, you know, you're involved in some sort of altercation that included firearms, I'm going to give you a call. You're my friend. I owe you that. I'm going to call you and find out what happened. I'm not going to get on social media or make a video instantly without calling my friend, especially if you're my friend and we're actually boys, not industry mates, but we're actually friends. You've met my mom. You've come to my house. You know my last name, all those kind of things. Like those are the things that I would give you the benefit of that, and I'd give you a call. And I think if he legitimately thinks those people, Kalani and Jojo, should have given him a call. Again, this is only if you believe Tory Lane's side of the story. If what he's saying is true, then yeah, you should be, you should feel aggrieved. You should want to say something like, "Hey, that 
that was kind of whack, right? You're my friend. You should have you should have given me the benefit of the doubt, or you should at least called me and heard my side of it. And then if you decide to do the other thing, then cool. But you know, everyone wants to be performative. Everyone wants to um, you know show that they're doing something good, show that they're being virtuous. But really, they're just performing for the spectators, and they don't really you know. They, this is probably for Tori. I'd imagine or somebody going through that experience. I'd imagine this is a better indication of who your friends actually are than what happened prior, especially during the quarantine radio days. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people that were slubbing on his knob when he was on quarantine radio and doing all those great things on social media, getting out of his deal and blowing up and doing great things. And now, so suddenly, he's been accused of something, right? Accused of something that looks very, very, very dubious if you look at some of the details. And suddenly, everyone's meant to kind of fall in line and cancel him. It's like, why? Why can't people use a bit of critical thinking and think, you know what, mm, that, that story doesn't really match up or I'm going to wait for the authorities to get involved and then I'll decide what I think of the story. And yeah, I agree. And because I, I really do think that, that what, we, what we are not seeing enough of is more female artists getting together and really supporting one another. That's what's... That's never going to happen though, isn't it? Women hate women. I think there's a lot of studies out there that say that, man. Like, you look at what was that study about? Most women hate working for female bosses. It just is what it is, isn't it? There's, that, that's never going to happen, especially in an industry where they purposely pit women against each other, right? Record industries purposely place or purposely put women in competition with one another, causing unnecessary friction and causing unnecessary divide support looks mm -hmm. like yeah I that agree. really is what support looks like so shout out to y'all for doing that because i think that was really powerful and it, and it was important and i and to me again we haven't seen a lot of i have not seen a lot of men come out there have been there have been a few there have been a few why would they come out if they don't know what really happened why would anybody come out part of the reason why some of these um blog posts i mean sorry some of these blogs on social media are really destructive to whatever community or whatever subculture you're interested in is because they comment on gossip. They comment on rumors, right? They don't comment on things that actually occurred. They don't go out of their way to um, find out what actually happened. They don't do any sort of journalistic investigation. They just report on stuff they've heard in comments, stuff they might have heard, overheard in a podcast, things they've seen on the video, interpreting weird Instagram stories. It's never truth-seeking. It's never truth-seeking. So why would you go out of your way to comment on something that you've seen third or second hand, right? on another platform and then kind of put your flag in the mouth and say, oh, I know what happened. This happened there. It's like, what was wrong with you? COVID is out in the air, man. There's many things that we should be worrying about as opposed to what occurred in that vehicle. And again, if you want to investigate it for what we've seen so far, the DLs don't really stack up in Megan Thee Stallion's favor from what I've seen so far. But again, I'm remaining neutral because there's a court case pending. And then guess what? Once all the evidence comes out, I'll be able to make my own mind up anyway. Yeah. Bumby came out and Bumby came out and spoke against Tori. He did. He did. Um, but very few, very few male artists have come out and say, you know, that he's a that he's a clown for how he handled himself. Or again, you're allowed to call him a clown. You're allowed to call out people who haven't stood up for her. But you know, there's no obligation to do either. Either. Or even with the outlet for, and maybe here's the thing: none of us were there, right? So we don't even know. So I can't even. I'm not even. None of us really know unless we were there. Cool. Innocent until proven guilty. I guess. I guess. How does that work? So when somebody, so let, let's just, let's, let's make this make sense. When a black person is falsely accused, it's innocent until proven guilty. When somebody within your own community does something to a black woman, because allegedly black women are the most unprotected uh, people in the world. I don't know where that phrase comes from. I don't know what evidence supports that, but let's just agree that that's true. It's one of those mantras that you just say that sort of like, you know, it's like a little jingle that makes sense, right? Cool, let's say that's true. If that's the case, why wouldn't you give the same grace that you would give some kid being accused of, you know, I, I don't know, those random stories you see in America of some guy planted evidence on a flipping suspect in a, in a drive by or whatever it may be. I don't know, pulled over a kid and he planted evidence on him, right? Why do you give that kid that got planted evidence a bligh, even though he's got a, an extremely long rap sheet, right? You still think, you know what? I don't trust that cop because he's got a history of planting evidence, but you don't want to give Tory Lanez the benefit of the doubt. Because so far, for again, this is the thing you have to remember. If this was anybody else, then if this is someone that had a history of like, you know, violence towards women or just in ge violence in general, then I'd be understandable that why you'd say, hey, it is possible that he could do that. Again, we don't know the guy. No one's, no, I don't, I'm not fucking familiar with the dude. Could give two shits. I enjoy the music and I keep it moving. But let's say you are somebody with a history of violence. Then I, then I understand why you'd be um, more willing to, except that he did actually do the things that he's been alleged of he's been accused of doing but so far we've not seen any evidence or prior to this case we've seen no evidence of Tory Lanez being violent or especially to women right we've seen him having some dust-ups with uh what what's his name 
uh, Travis Scott and stuff, right? We see him having some dust ups with Drake, where they kind of settled it and they're sort of on good accord. But in terms of women's stuff, we've not actually seen him get involved in any kind of. Um, the only beef I saw him get involved in was one on one of the dolls, right? I think he, um, one of the dolls made a diss track about him or something. I don't know what that stemmed from. But there hasn't been any case of him being violent, him being a douche, him being a dickhead to women in general. He's pro he's pretty much carried himself pretty well for the most part for, for the most part there are some things that he's done that i've probably not been a fan of but for the most when it comes to women i've not really seen anything so to to immediately think that he could be guilty just because a woman somebody that happens to have the same genitalia as you said is just insane it's really really insane i wonder what would happen if a white woman if, if this was kylie that accused tori of this what would they say that's the interesting part of it right a, a girl that kind of some people probably don't like some people think that she's probably trying to pretend to be black or whatever, taking a good black man away, right? Imagine what they'd say then. What do you think they'd say? So if that's the approach, I guess. If that's the approach we want to take, fine. But the handling of the allegations, I'm, I am an it's advocate. Wild. I'm an advocate for the how. Hmm, she's not making sense here. Okay, how am I meant to handle something if I, if I know I'm not guilty? Tell me. How you handle something, how you say something, how you move and on the on it, like in response to something to it me speaks volumes it shows yeah. me who you are for real but well, that doesn't make any sense though isn't it he didn't say nothing zero when the case happened zero when people were bashing his name in public when megan and stallion was getting on instagram and crying and basically naming him out naming him right on instagram live and saying you shot me tell them why you shot me you're getting people to go and you know tarnish my name in the media blah 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 blah, blah. he said nothing Right, I thought that would I even at myself, right, looking at it from the outside, I thought that was the one that's gonna trigger him. Nothing triggered him. He said nothing. He remained quiet, he kept his counsel and just let the courts, you know, let the court system go about doing his thing, let the police investigation um roll on. And now we've got a court date of of course, I think, you know, like I said, um next week or something like that happening very, very soon. But he said not a word. People were slandering his name, removing him, tracks from the playlist, putting up salacious tweets, saying wild thing on podcasts, Miles said some mad shit on the Joe Biden podcast and then walked it back because he spoke to his young boys right <laughs> it's like what what's he meant to do if he's not guilty like legitimately what's he meant to do just not say anything how you handle how you handle allegations like that the fact that there was not an immediate uh, not an immediate address she, she about to say apology but how can you apologize for something you didn't do immediate address what i meant to address i didn't shoot her but i'm gonna let the police investigation carry on and then he brings out the album is that gonna be okay come on to the people to apologize for even a misunderstanding. None of that. You dropped an album. Good night. Right. Good night, I sir. Mean, That's I what we have I to said say. it on Twitter and I'll say it again. We allow and again, this is the best thing to do, right? I'd imagine. I'm assuming because it's an album and it's music, you can argue that it's just entertainment purposes and none of the lyrics should be taken as fact. And if you are gonna be brought up to the stand, if you are gonna if you are gonna be grilled in court, it probably is best for you not to comment on things on an open case in public, right? That probably is the best thing to do. Don't comment in an open case. But again, people's first for gossip, people's first for information. They want people that are going through court cases to get on Instagram live and talk about their court case and essentially put themselves in more danger, put themselves in more trouble, especially if they've done nothing wrong, right? Because if you've done nothing wrong, best know the you know the, the person you're going to court against, their lawyers or their, their people advising them are going to make sure that they dig up any pieces of evidence that they can to slander your name. And unfortunately for Meg Thee Stallion, she was too quick. She kind of felt the pressure online. I don't know why she did it. She, she spoke out of turn too many times, let her friends say too many wild things online. That's probably, and eventually, even if it did happen, it's probably going to really, um, really going to, um, it's really going to fuck her over when it goes, when it goes to court. hundred percent. I definitely think so. There's too much information out there. Most of it is coming from Meg's team. Allowed him mm -hmm. in 2020 to use Instagram as a platform yeah. to degrade women. Yeah, mm. We cannot be surprised that this is the response. Oh, uh, you are talking out your ass. Well, because women were women were um, gladly right signing up to twerk on his platform. Right? Is is was Tory Lanez quality ready? The only place you've ever seen twerking on social media. And now you're trying to equate the fact that he has people twerking on his social media as the reason why he could potentially have shot a woman. That's insane. That's like saying because Joe Budden has a video of Vixen in his background of his video shaking her bum that he could abuse a woman. Hmm. But yeah, that's probably not a good example because he might have done it in the past. But that's not a good example. What are you talking about? In I this agree. situation, we can't. I agree. But I will and essentially, 
hip hop, like shake, like twerking of the bum is probably another pillar of hip hop. You know, what's it? The four pillars of hip, four pillars of hip hop are like what graffiti, uh, break dancing, DJing, and MCing. A fifth pillar might be big butts. Do you want to take down the fifth pillar of hip hop? The fifth pillar? You sure about that? We'll say in response to that situation, we're gonna move on because I don't want to give him no more of our pod time. Hey, there we go. <laughs> and that's, and that's that. Virtue signaling at his best, de- de- tarnish and drag a man's name through the mud due to an allegation and then get on your high horse and say, we're not going to talk about him anymore on our platform. Virtue signaling 101. <laughs> oh God, some of these people, man. Some of these people. Anyway, let's move on. Mm-hmm. What should we talk about here? Let's, 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 let's go, 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 let's go. Oh yeah, let's go to this one. This is this is a bit of a heartbreaking story, isn't it? So um, according to Fashion Demics, uh, that which I check irregularly from time to time, but they have some pretty interesting news pertaining to the streetwear culture. If you're a fan of all that malarkey, definitely make sure you ch- check them out. It's essentially the fashion version or the streetwear version, street style version, the V loan wearing chrome hearts drenched version of a DJ Academics platform where he essentially covers some of the most notable people within that scene. And he's been kind of covering this story that I kind of saw a glimpse of the other day where supposedly Cohen and Lucas Sabat don't follow each other anymore, right? They're not friends. And, you know, if you know anything about those guys from watching Cohen Frost uh, interview series and just seeing them parade themselves around on social media, you'd know that they were quite close, right? There was a period in time when it felt like Luca was maybe on the ascendancy of his modeling career and still hustling in the old dirty streets of New York that they were hanging around quite often. And of course, you know, that guy becomes popular, does his own thing, and they sort of like, you know, they sort of... Um, get a bit distant and not as close as they were in the past but still you could see that there was love there right they started from the mud they started together it was an organic relationship and then suddenly fashion mx reports hey these guys are falling out they're not following each other anymore but you know who who gives a shit about who's following who right i've never checked who's following me i don't care if i follow someone they don't follow me back it's social media i don't give a crap you you click you you, you double tap you like you comment you move the fuck on but of course, you know, in this world of influencers and people um, that I quote unquote public figures, not following somebody back or unfollowing somebody is a big, big indication of trouble right behind the scenes, things that are going on in real life. And it's also a declaration of I've ended a friendship. I'm not your friend anymore. Unfollow. Right. That's basically what people do. So that's an indication of it. But unfortunately, the reason behind the unfollow looks to be a lot more serious than um, you might have envisioned or what we might have envisioned um, according to what um fashion is reporting so it looks like cohen frost has split up with his longtime girlfriend um erin um you know if you've known anything about cohen especially going on his social media prior to him getting i guess with his new girl that they were all all over the social medias all over some of the blog pages all over some of the street where um street style websites and shit you know walking hand in hand a real power couple within the scene doing big things and having listened to the most recent the one actually, I think, yeah, Cohen actually deleted it from his YouTube channel, unfortunately. Um, there was an interview that he did with Lucas Sabat, I think the second one, where he essentially spoke of glo- in glowing terms about how Erin essentially changed his life, right? She he came in and essentially um, got his business affairs in order, uh, put some protocols and practices in place and essentially just provided him with the best possible platform for him to, you know, go on and make Spaghetti Boys or whatever he's doing at the moment a big success. And it's, again, it's no coincidence that, you know, since he hooked up or since he got together with Erin and they've and they've got a kid and they got married and it's you know were essentially a a uh, functioning family that his career you know in terms of streetwear and all these sort of consultancy sort of stuff that he's doing um flourished right you see him standing around with kanye you see him going to fashion shows you see his collaboration with adidas it's no surprise that those things come hand in hand considering what he said on the, on the interview again i'm not reading into it what he said on the interview but unfortunately it looks like they're split up and i guess um cohen decided to announce it in the most scumbaggy way possible and this probably is a, a reason why i'm assuming why luca and cohen fell out i would assume so right because i guess because if this was my friend i'm not talking to you anymore either do you know what i mean like if I know you and I know your girl and you're actually together, again, not somebody you're hooking up with, like that's your actual girl, like you've got a kid together and you're married, you live together and shit, and then you just walk out on her, like we're not boys, like that's it. You know what I mean? We're not boys. We're not, we're not talking for a good while, especially if you've got no good reason as to why you've done so and you just what? Because you decided you're bored of being a dad, you're bored of being a husband. That's not good enough, do you know what I mean? So anyway, um, Fashion Damage reported on it and here's um, the post that they reported on and it says the following, you've got a picture up here of Erin, you've got picture up here of Kerwin with his new missus who looks 
you know, oddly very familiar um, to Cohen. And you've got Cohen's post here that he pressed on Instagram, which is now private, which makes sense. Good boy, because I'm sure his comments are horrendous. Um, it says the following caption is him sitting on top of a mountainside with his new girl with some pictures, people here in the background, maybe taking some new some content pictures he's going to share. And he says the following. We come in peace, love and unity. We live on light and we are orientated. We balance every scale. This guy's a piece of shit, mate. Oh my God. He's going for the woo-woo <laughs> explanation for him walking out in his family. Um, we uh, All roads open before us. Our destiny draws nearer to us in every breath. All weapons formed against us will fall. And I pity and... Uh, I, I I pity the entirety that tries to form again any against us. Is this guy? What is this? Is this Christian or is this just some like New Age shit? Um, we divinely guided, protected, blessed, highly favored, forever and ever. Amen. I guess it's Christian. Who and who knows? But again, two sides to every story. I'm sure Cohen has his side to explain, but this optically wise doesn't look good, right? It doesn't look good. You've got a family, you've got a kid, and you just walk out on them, and then you post this online. That's mad, isn't it? And then I guess um, reporting wise, um, he obviously got Cohen here in the comments saying, "I hope some of the, I hope, I hope they, I hope they register to vote," which is funny. And then of course, someone in the comments said the following: "That was fast." And another person report uh, replied back said, "Oh, for real, nigga, <coughs> ain't even let him marinate again." And then Aaron unfortunately commented too and said, "A complete and utter joke." Walked out on his family literally two weeks ago. Pathetic, like youch, man, youch. And I am. I was actually on Erin's profile the other day. She, I think, it's gone now. But she posted an entire stream of uh, video clips from the interview that Cohen deleted. I'm, I'm sure she's got um, access to the hard copy because I'm sure she was doing and um, handling some stuff for him behind the scenes in terms of doing that interview. But the way he was talking so glowingly about his wife in that interview to now suddenly be in this place now where they've, it's just not on in it. It's just weird in it, especially playing out in public. So I guess the only thing to really glint glean from this i guess for kids coming up is that you know everyone goes through that what they go through when it comes to relationships it is what it is right we've all got issues we've all got stuff that happens behind the scenes but i think there needs to be some common decency there needs to be some uh protocol some gentlemanly conduct that needs to happen when you are interacting with females or anybody that you're interested in you, because love does crazy things to people it really really does but if somebody has given you you know has, has essentially spent a lot of time with you you they deserve an explanation they deserve a a even an opportunity to mend the relationship in some way shape or form and if that's not possible then yeah as adults you go in your merry way but to sort of publicly um state that you've moved on in this really public way in you know again embarrassing your lady because you know she's not like a it'd be different if she was like an a person that was behind the scenes that no one actually knew but erin's very popular in her own regard right she's very popular in depop she's very popular you know on social media um with the with the stuff that she makes and just in general being a bit of a um, well-liked person she's got numerous fan accounts people actually like this girl right so she's a kind of public figure in her own regard and you obviously as an entity or public figures in your own regard too so i would imagine that she deserves a bit of an explanation she deserves a chance to maybe make it work or you deserve you deserve to not that you deserve but you should be um cognitive or aware of trying to explain your position in some way, shape or form to the public that were kind of rooting from you from the outside. And I guess that's the issue with having a public relationship. As much as you shouldn't explain yourself to anybody, because you're parading yourselves around and talking about her in glowingly terms all the time on social, you sort of basically owe it to the to the people that follow you and to herself as well, more importantly. And people forget the people that follow you for an explanation. But again, what do I know? And then I guess it con it continued on. And there's a I think this is kind of the original post um from Aaron as well. I mean, maybe a reply basically explaining what went on. And again, it doesn't it doesn't look good for my guy Kerwin, man. It really paints him in a horrendous light. Again, this is just one side of the story. We don't know what Kerwin's side of it. But considering his personality and considering what we know of him from social, this really does make some sense. And oh God. So um Arian posted this on a story via Fashion Demix. Kerwin walked out on me and Waffle. I guess that's their kid. Um legitimately 16 days ago i told them to just get some space go to la suggested splitting the professional from work because they work together right um from the family um to try to save the family family counseling individual therapy a vacation everything right that's what every that's what every wife should be doing again this is the thing modern era people are too quick to divorce people are too quick to split up but i do believe in the idea of counseling the idea of mediating the idea of trying to save a marriage because you know 
I, I haven't grown up with a family with a single parent, but I'd imagine it's pretty difficult, right? And if you have your two parents around, you, they should be trying everything within their powers to make it work. And if they can't make it work, then cool, move on, split amicably and co-parent like, you know, like flipping flipping Lenny Kravitz does, right? Do that in that regard, cool. Or like Kevin Hart does, you, people, it can be done. But this quick, this kind of rush to split up and go chase the newer, brighter thing across the road is really, really gross. Um, it continues. Um, he was physically, but again, they're really young in it. So I don't know, man. Maybe they just got into it too fast anyway. Who knows? Um, it continues here. Uh, da, 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 da. Why did I continue here? Uh, bah, bah, bah. Oh, he was physically and verbally abusing me, but I let that shit slide to try and hold things together. Jesus Christ, like I always have. Okay, that's a bad, bad uh, accusation. I fell out of love due to I fell out of love due to a lack of support he shared after Waffle was born. This was never a fifty-fifty partnership, and I used to be able to handle it. But with baby responsibilities, I needed help, and this was his whiny crybaby man-child. So this is another indication as to why I'm not a big believer in people praising or worshipping um, some of these public figures or social media influencers online. They are nobody. They are just like you and I. They make mistakes. They make errors. They misstep. They say crazy shit. You shouldn't in any uncertain terms be looking at them for as to be any kind of uh, moral compass, any kind of indication as to what you should do in your everyday life. You should view them for the fits, view them for the cultural insights, and that's about it. Draw a line underneath it because you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. This guy's on his social media parading around with his son, acting like a really proud dad and doing the great things, but behind the scenes, allegedly, look what's going on i agreed to f i agreed to uh, finish up a few uh, pending deals with a standard manager commission attached for the rest for the first time right this is because again i'm guessing because as a relationship he was she wasn't taking any cut she was just helping him out on the strength of their love so we could uh, leave this with some cushion and without any loose ends I never took a paycheck or demanded equity in the business we established. It's very, very true. Especially if you remember, if you read, or if you remember the interview he did with Luca, he definitely did make it seem as if they were a partnership. It wasn't like, you know, because I'm guessing on his side, he's now alleging that she was fleecing him. Again, really disgusting, really yucky, in it? Stuff to really be doing in public. But hey, I worked my fucking ass off for three years and he can't even tie his own shoes. <laughs> Literally. Is that why he's always wearing slip-ons and Velcro shoes? Oh, God almighty. Curl in then a few hours later he posts on his social media that we are no longer together oh yeah yeah i'm no longer able to represent him because he just embarrassed our family with the same narcissistic selfish uh selfie from three weeks ago asking for prayers yeah that's really terrible that's the thing in it as well like embarrassing the family in public that's the thing you need to be able oh this is so bad this is so bad so so bad man if true um he signed a lease in two days to live 40 minutes away in a five-bedroom apartment in a dangerous neighborhood uh, uh and wowed by the price not smart when you're a public figure who's had many threatening and violent interactions yeah oh yeah do you remember <laughs> the epic fight with ian connor he actually held his own there but again you know holding your own holding your own against ian connor isn't much of a uh victory in it really he's like what 40 pounds soaking wet uh but i agreed to a 50 50 custody and had him come pick up waffle three days later what three days later for three days he was one hour late he called two days later and screamed at me to come and get him literally threw her at me with a pea sipping through her diaper jesus christ i scheduled mediation he didn't even show up but because his hair appointment took longer than he thought yo this guy is future level scumbags isn't it god damn it cohen I didn't know you were doing shit like that behind the scenes, man. You treat thoughts like this, but the mother of your child should have some level of respect or decency. No matter, that's what I would imagine. So again, unless somebody gives you a reason to be an absolute cock to them, especially if there's a mother of your children, you should be trying your best to be courteous as you can, isn't it? Um, but again, love does crazy things, man. Love is like grief, isn't it? It does crazy things to people. It makes people super irrational. Um, a few days later, I offered to meet him solely to help transition work stuff over. As I could tell, he has no plan and was scrambling. I tell him I'm t looking at apartments in Soho. A few hours later, I literally walk into him and his hussy playing puppy love in the street. Oh! What a cunt. Nine days after, <laughs> nine days after he left. Oh, and she's not new. They dated before we met. Meanwhile, he's telling his assistant to coordinate the move for him because he can't do a damn thing for himself. The assistant quit work for him, by the way. <laughs> quit to work for, quit to work for me, by the way. Okay, cool. Um, that's why he needs a new mummy. 
I guess that's a way easier than trying to sort out your own responsibilities like a man. But he isn't one. He needs intensive therapy and time alone to um, heal from the whirlwind of romance he had for three years. Exactly. Jesus Christ, man. Literally making magic happen with our bare hands and birthing an angel. But his priorities are all wrong. I didn't force him to do anything ever. I'd love to claim what? I, he'd love to claim I was a puppet master, but I literally made his dreams come true. Oh, oh, oh Cohen, you are a scumbag, according to this man. God damn it, you're a bad guy. Um, the last fight we had was about him auditioning for a voiceover part in Baby Shark. <gasps> I put together an incredible pitch for a Christmas special that I saw he was hesitant about, but I believed in. The last communication we had about it were texts of me saying, okay, take at least one week, uh, one look at the deck and link if you want, um, and it should we should kill it. He said, I love it. There is so much more. I have 40 pages of journals. This morning he talked to the mediator. We, he talked to the mediator and were rescheduled to him to waffle this weekend, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Jesus Christ. He secured so many bags for this guy. It seems, I was like, God damn it. Next slide. This is, I guess, his post. He said, my past relationship was toxic. Aaron was my manager and we had not spoken about anything outside of business for the past four months. We're already practicing co-parenting and left alone. We're not able to break separation from the two houses that are work and I love, and it was always a sticky situation. We fell out of love. She has ended it with me when I wanted to relieve myself from work past telephone um and wanted to get back to work uh what go up past telephone and get back to work which i didn't agree with and i realized i had to get out of this relationship when you generally love somebody and all they care about is money they make you they make off you it's time to go oh. but you can't do this about it, mother again i don't i don't condone this behavior even if she is fleecing you even if she is you know um, essentially bleeding you dry you should never treat the mother of your children like this in public. I don't I don't agree with this whatsoever. Especially, no, you don't do this. I, you don't do this. I don't agree with this whatsoever. Young kids, if you're watching, don't do this. I have found freedom and happiness over everything. God damn it, this guy. And I guess it's supposed to him with his new girl. 2020. And then what was the last one? And then I guess um, to crown the, obviously the cancellation and the, the turn of events, Lucas Abbott got on his uh, Instagram live and declared... <laughs> I've never heard of a Kerwin in my life, man. I don't know what you're talking about. There we have it then, isn't it? Um, Kerwin's essentially left his family, been abandoned by his best friend, allegedly, and is now telling people to go vote. <laughs> what an absolute shit show of a situation. But again, conclusion of this story, lessons to be learned. Don't idolize influencers. Look at them for the fits or cultural relevance, whatever it is that they, entertainment that they um, provide you on the timeline. You never know what these guys are getting up to privately. But if there is a lesson to be learned from this directly, never ever treat the mother of your children with this level of disrespect. Never treat your wife with this level of disrespect, especially in public. Try your best to deal with the situation behind closed doors um, as privately as you can. And if if it then requires you to come out, out, you know, if your name is being slandered or you feel as if the story is being misconstrued in some really egregious way, cool come out and speak your piece but say it again in a very respectful manner there is a way to say these things there is a way to conduct yourself in public especially when it's concerning someone that you love somebody you're in relationship with a committed relationship with and this in my opinion isn't a way to go about it but again what do i know okay moving on in moving on out what else we got to talk about here ba -ba 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 -ba. oh this is a good one so as you know, in the UK, we're still under the grips of COVID-19 and this lovely, lovely, stupendous Tory government has decided within the infinite knowledge to implement further restrictions within the hospitality industry, um, not allowing clubs to open, obviously putting more restrictions on bars and pubs to close at 10 p.m. due to a curfew in order to stem the effects of COVID. But if you've been paying attention, you will know that hospitality industry only contributes to guess what? 5% of cases um, concerning with COVID. So the rationale about closing clubs, the rationale about curfewing some of the bars that are open at the moment doesn't make 
any sense. And essentially, a whole industry has been completely kaputzed due to their um, reluctance to look at the evidence available and due to their um, general desire to turn every club into Frank Manka or whatever it is that exists in Dawson. I think I mentioned it earlier on Twitter, actually, that Stoke Newton and Dawson should have been an indication for us Londoners to know exactly what direction this Tory government was going to go in. They were never fans of party times. They were never fans of nightclubs. They wanted to turn every club every sort of like stand-up dancey bar cocktail bar into a restaurant or a clothing store that's essentially what they wanted and they've got their wish now off the back of covid where they can essentially kill and strangle um, an industry slowly but surely by not providing any help and not providing any assistance um to an industry that you know is get away from the djs get away from the people that are in such essentially in front of the screens imagine the amount of people behind the scenes people that you know the operators within the venues the people that um you know uh whose livelihood is supported by the operation of said venues how they've been negative Affected. it's really really bad but fortunately um Shirelle um, is that how you pronounce the name Shirelle or Shirelle 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 who's very popular here in the UK DJ and radio presenter got on BBC and essentially stood up for us DJs and made some very very good points on the BBC and I'm going to play some of her comments here via the Twitter let's get the picture how have things changed for you in the last six months uh, the last six months for me have been brutal mental health ways and I know for a fact that me too. people feel the same way. So hearing everything that, you know, Rishi Sunak today was basically discussing with regards to, you know, we can't save all of the jobs and, you know, we can retrain really broke my heart and I'm sure it broke a lot of people's hearts at home, especially we've trained so long. To, to, to be in our jobs and we're, and we're completely suffering. And that's a problem too as well, right? It's like, I think, I said it prior, I think there is, there is, a, se there is a certain segment of the DJ um, Twitter sphere that kind of believes that the government should do bend over backwards in order to ensure every club, every job, every position is kept open. But I think there are some realists out there that obviously understand that we're in sticky times, everyone's going through it, no one is essentially... Uh, most people have been affected negatively due to COVID and uh, unless you're, you know, you're of affluent means, some people have been, most people have been negatively affected. So there are some adjustments that are going to be needed to be made temporarily, right? Everyone understands that. If you have no gigs, if, you, if the last time you played was February or March, it probably would make sense to kind of pick up a part-time job in a supermarket, whatever it may be, just so you can pay the bills, right? And then the stuff opens up, you can get back to doing what you're doing. But the issue at hand here, it feels like, the Tory government is completely abandoning the nightlife industry, which is, I think, going to have a negative effect on the other side of things. Because it's fair enough going out and saying, hey, we can't keep any uh, any jobs. We, you know, Everyone has to retrain. No guarantee on keeping your job. Bloody blah, 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 blah. It's all fair enough to say that, right? That that makes complete sense. Cool. That, that There is some logic in that. But the other thing that's not fair about it, or the thing that doesn't really make any sense, there's no support for the clubs. There's no support for the bars or the institutions where we kind of work or where we kind of go to socialize, where we go to hang out. So what's to say once this thing is over, once COVID has finally uh, passed, that we're even going to have venues and places to go back and work? Where would they be? Where would the promoters be? Would the, how, have the promoters moved on into new areas? Have the festival organizers move on to new areas? Have the club owners move on to new areas? The event bookers, uh, the people that work behind the scenes, or even behind the bar, the barbacks, the bartenders, whatever it may be, people at the door, have they moved on? So that's the issue. It's all, it's, it's all well and good telling people to retrain now, but what are you going to do for us going forward? Do you think people are doing that? Are they just leaving the industry, or are they? I mean, I mean, for you, you, yes. you could, you could do, you can't do streaming. You can't, no. you can't take it anywhere no. out of a live venue, right? I mean, you can do live streaming, but it's not profitable, and a lot of people do want to leave. I mean, for mm, that's the thing. Now, the the issue is again part of the problem to be a little bit of a uh, to play devil's advocate or to kind of not devil's advocate to sort of give another opinion on this. The issue at the moment as well with DJing is quite similar to the issue that's happening in the restaurant industry, where there are certain segments of the restaurant industry that were super resistant to technology, super resistant to, you know, the changing climate in the industry, that they've been kind of caught off guard with COVID, right? When COVID shuts down your ability to, you know, invite people into your place of work or your establishment to eat, you don't have to kind of, you know, 
um, uh, make some adjustments and, you know, maybe cater your menu to a delivery service like Uber Eats or Deliveroo. But not every restaurant has that ability to do so, right? Because they ne not have necessarily put the protocols in place to enable them to do, to do that. Or more importantly, they haven't necessarily exposed the client or the customer to their goods prior to COVID on that platform. So it's very difficult for them you to start up doing Uber Eats now, competing with all the other restaurants that are out there, all the dark kitchens that exist that are not even walking restaurants that have been killing it and have precise menus that travel well in the back of someone's moped. It's very difficult then for you to decide to do it now. Same with the DJ thing, right? There are DJs have, that have been streaming. I follow a few of them on Twitch that are very popular on Twitch. Some of them not the best DJs, don't get me wrong. People probably will never see and go play in a nightclub, but they stream on Twitch regularly, right? Five days a week, sometimes seven days a week, consistently on Twitch prior to COVID. So as soon as COVID struck, they were all well and good to continue doing to doing what they were doing. There are also some DJs that perform in big clubs and, you know, in, in, in big festivals and tour and stuff who were also supplementing their income with streaming when they, when they were back at home or in the studio. So those people or those DJs were more um, were in a far better position to kind of respond to the changing climate of the world. So that's the unfortunate reality of it, right? If you if you were if your only revenue stream, if your only way to make money, if your only way to play was to be in a nightclub, this is really going to affect you negatively. And unfortunately, there is no resolution. I see, in my opinion, again, I was really early on this in the beginning, not to not to be some sort of um you know some. Billy knows it or whatever but I said from the very onset when they were kind of telling us oh we're going to save our summer we're going to do all this nonsense that Boris Johnson was talking about I said this that's not going to happen we're going to be in this mess for a year at least at least and I thought a year meaning that we'll get back to normal in January but now look we're going to we're going to go into 18 months supposedly this new restriction we've got now is going to go into March right so it's effectively 18 months so we're going to be um, under, under some kind of restriction so I knew that was the case and if that's the case you're going to have to make some adjustments that's just an unfortunate part of it now again these are just temporary adjustments I think long term that's the issue that Rishi actually needs to be pulled up on Rishi Sunak needs to be pulled up on hey what are you going to do for the clubs and establishments that we go and work at um once this thing is over are they still going to be open will we even have a fold will that place still exist once covid is over or will we have to start from scratch with no experience for myself i'm on the self-employment scheme and i sometimes find myself struggling i've got friends on exactly. universal credit and they're unable to either choose the choice of either paying rent or you know paying for food and basic amenities to actually keep them yeah it's surviving. terrible it's terrible i wish we were slightly like germany in regards to the package that they helped uh their people received in the creative industry mm -hmm. and unfortunately our government are not doing that the tories are letting us down and really Unfortunately, everything that they said today was completely deplorable. Well, they yeah, they are. They let us down. It's completely deplorable. But I just, I don't know, man. It's Tories doing what Tories do in it. I'm really not that much. I, I'm not that surprised by it, really. I really am not. If anything, the best thing that we can kind of get from this is, again, to get some kind of immediate action plan as to what they're going to do for these establishments and for people that are working or the, the places that we go to work in. I just don't think they're ever going to come around to preparing a package for people that work within the creative or, or, or within the arts. It's just not going to happen, especially in the same way that Berlin does it or that Germany does. It. It's just not going to happen. They're not set up for that. They're not that kind of government, unfortunately, man. It's just so, 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 so annoying, especially when you tell people to retrain. Imagine telling DJs that have been DJing for 10 years right 10 years right to go and retrain that's the, I'm, not, I'm not saying because i've been i've been djing for 10 years right but I, but i've you know dj for 10 years you know playing your time here and there playing on the weekends at bars and clubs but i mean imagine if you're a professional dj you're touring for 10 years and now you've been told to retrain what are you going to retrain doing what can you what are you legitimately skilled to do in a workplace tell me what can you do yes you might have worked in a shop 10 years ago but that was 10 years ago who wants to hire you? Why would you even go, like, are you even going to be a good employee? Let alone, are you high, Are you employable? Are you going to be a good employee? Probably not. Like, it's not going to make any sense. You've been, you've been moving to the beat of your own drum for the last 10 years, working in your dream job that you've hustled your ass off. And again, that's a thing as well, it's so annoying for it. DJing, much like much, much, uh, DJing like any other occupation in the arts, there's no straight path to becoming successful. There's no straight path to having a career in it, right? And imagine, even for Cheryl is a good example, right? She's a very brilliant example. She blew up kind of off the back of that unfortunate incident that she had on Boiler Room where she, she played some sick tune and an overzealous DJ pulled it up, right? A fellow DJ that was on the scene. And it caused a bit of a, 
you know, up on social, blah, 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 blah. But off the back of that, it increased her profile. People actually viewed the boiler room set that she'd done that was flipping incredible, right? And it kind of took her to the next level. And then I think, I think I remember seeing a tweet about her announcing that she's suddenly now got, you know, now I've decided to go full time with my music, right? Because I guess the, the gigs were lining up well. There was some money in the bank. Like, yeah, finally I've done it, right? I don't have to work in a flipping crappy um, nine to five. I can just commit to working, um, being a professional DJ. My dream occupation, I've secured it. But it takes so long. It's such a windy path. Like, it's so difficult to do. And okay, of course, unless you're Emily Lenz and you're, you know, and you're a formal model, then you could just, you know, you could just pop up the list but most people it just takes ages to do there's no there's no uh, direct route so to be told now once you finally got your dream in hand to let it go and then you're not given any assurances that once you kind of you know grow up and become an adult and say okay cool let's let's just temporarily put my dream to the side and let me go get a job in tesco's you still don't be given any assurances that that club that you played there is still going to be there have had this cultural recovery fund haven't yes. they and boris johnson mentioned live music today so you yes. you are on their mind i mean do you feel that this is going to get better you're on the, yeah. you're on the radar now or? in in a way yes but to be honest with you that particular fund that uh, you know that boris was talking about today is actually a week behind it's delayed so currently though of be course it is of course you know, run clubs in london at the moment having really difficult conversations with their landlords about whether they're actually going to be able to pay you know their rent on time for this week jesus and Christ. they were expecting that money to come in it's jesus the Christ. whole industry you know music and live music is in complete dire straits and it's, it's very stressful absolute for us all. disarray absolute disarray man absolute disarray but yeah big up Cheryl. um she smashed it very good insight from her but then on the flip side we have this really odd kind of again the beef within amongst djs is so bizarre and again i've only noticed it now because due to covid i've kind of been more active on twitter as opposed to any other social media platform you know unfortunately i need to kind of step back a bit from there but god the infighting man it's just odd it's so odd because when you go on when you go on instagram and you go on and you kind of read through the comments of some prominent djs you just see nothing but love right nothing but adulation nothing but fans trying to get the attention of somebody that they look up to you go on twitter and you see mad people usually peers not even fans of this of the music peers that work within the industry calling out people for certain things da, 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 being snarky saying mad shit there's loads of infighting and if ever there was a time where we can sort of like we should be gathering around each other and putting our arms around each other and sort of helping each other out and having sort of like a solid front it should be now it should be now right because i think apart from germany everyone's fucked right in europe like we're all fucked when it comes to live music especially in america right we're all completely fucked so we should be doing our best to help each other out but this is another example of this weird infighting that this really doesn't make any again i get it in some regard because it's, it's the blessed madonna uh, aka also known as or the artist formerly known as the black madonna she kind of divides opinion but god this is really unnecessary so i guess black madonna tweeted the following she said i guess in response to the current conversation going around which richie sunak said about you know you need to go and retrain and get new jobs if you're working in the arts she said something along the lines of according to this tweet here and what precisely would I or any other artist retrain for? Um, I spent my entire adult life retraining uh, as a copywriter, restaurant manager, data entry person, and every other job you can imagine. I work to get out of those jobs and to do what I'm great at. We all know how to do day jobs, right? And then this guy um, called Dr. Matthias, who I follow on social, who's a pretty interesting follower because he has some spicy takes. Um, he says the following, he quotes it and says, there's something really abject about DJs with a substantial amount of wealth LARPing, live action role playing, in, in case you're unfamiliar with the acronym, as struggling artists, dot, dot, dot. Do they actually need to retrain or can they just safely ride out the pandemic with their assets? Uh, again, it's so disgusting of a question. Again, in general, pocket watching is something I've never been a fan of. I understand it during these kind of um bad times that we're going through you know when you're really struggling the only thing that you can do or the only thing that you kind of reach near to is somebody near you that's sort of thriving and sort of pull them down i get that kind of inclination but this is this is of no benefit of no use to anybody breaking the whole thing down um in in, in this in actuality and again this is coming from somebody that had a lot of spicy things to say about the business techno guys going around and touring at the beginning of, the, of covid but legitimately right unless you're germany unless you're france maybe not not now because they've gone around the lockdown again but especially when possession was going on most places are fucked right for the year are done right and that affects everybody in every industry 
and it affects everybody on and any kind of level of wealth or any kind of level of richness or yeah say rich yeah no wealth wealth you'll be okay if you're rich you're still gonna be still gonna struggle because most of the time from what i've from my own experience talking to people who have you know who live in swanky apartments and drive really nice cars unfortunately some of these people don't actually own anything outright most of the stuff they have is just leased because I think, you know, the thinking is because you earn a lot of money, you can afford to lease things. You don't need to, you know, have an asset depreciate in your garage, even if it is a Lamborghini, just because you have just just to say you have it. You could just go, you know, rent different cars, stay in different lavish apartments and keep it moving because, you know, there's constant flow of money coming in due to your gigs in it. So if you're a big DJ and you're playing every gig you're playing, you're getting 30 grand in your account. You can probably excuse yourself to, you know, paying 10 grand rent and five grand for your car note. It is what it is. But the only way to sustain that is with a steady income of gigs, right? So with the world completely shut down, even if you are at the top of that sort of quote unquote rich level, you're still going to be suffering because there's no money coming in. So the apartment that you've can, you signed a lease for for the next two years, the car that you signed a lease for, for however many years you signed a car lease for, those notes need to be paid. So you need to play in order to sustain those bills. That's why those guys, I'm assuming, and girls went out to go play these um, ill-advised plague graves and essentially set back countries, you know, months, if not years in their COVID recovery. Super selfish, super entitled. It is what it is. People do what they want to do. But it wasn't done from just a reckless sense of abandon. It was obviously done from a need, like they needed the money. Of course, it's kind of shown them up because it, you know, you've seen that a lot of these people aren't necessarily in for the music or in it for the culture, which they never were, right? If you're one of the five top 5% 5 earners, I'd very much think that you know DJing is just a job for you at the moment, right? You probably lost the love for it a long, long time ago. There are the special few that exist that probably do still have the love for it, but I would assume you spend too much, you spend too long in something, you get exposed to too much of the good stuff at the top, you're probably gonna get you know numb to it and it's just going to come a job cool but they still need to make money there's nothing wrong with that right everyone needs to make money everyone needs to make an income and at the moment our governments worldwide are not doing a good enough job in order to provide us with any kind of idea as to when we can return to clubs and bars so anybody is allowed to complain whether you're scream whether you're uh, the blessed madonna whether you're Emily lens who are despised whether you're peggy goo who are despised right these people who are currently you know make maybe not peggy goo because their family are you know wealthy and they're from south korea maybe they can you know supplement her income but again it's all pocket watching and that's gay that's not something that i condone in any way shape or form don't pocket watch look after yourself especially now during covid no one's looking after you no one's looking after us no one's looking after our community no one's after anyone no one's looking after us we have to look after ourselves and look after the people around us that's what I think we should do. And I think going after people on, online, telling them they're LARPing and that they should be okay with their riches. What, how do you know? What do you, how do you know what she has to pay for? What, what do you know about her bills? What do you know about her life? Like, it's just not fair. Do you know what I mean? It really does not fair, this kind of infighting that we have at the moment. And it serves no purpose. Once we get out of this, the other side, if you want to go out calling out all the rich individuals in, in, on, in DJ world, do it. I don't give a shit. But at the moment where we all need to kind of present a united front, this probably isn't the best way to go about it. And again, he continues doing some other things. Yes, yeah, yeah, no point in even getting into that. But, you know, I just don't see how that's constructive, man. I really, really don't, man. I, I wish you could be a little bit more... Um, I wish we could kind of just, you know, do away with the infighting and sort of do our best to try and rescue and save this dying industry that's being led to that's being allowed to sort of bleed out on the table man because like, that's essentially what the Tories are going to do especially here in the UK or in most places in Europe except for Germany right they're not going to give a toss about you know live music venues um so yeah let's stop with the infighting and just be friends again at least temporarily okay next on the list what else do we have to talk about yeah what else, what else, what else, what else? Oh, 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 oh. So, um, as I'm sure you're, most of you guys are aware, um, Joe Rogan's been going through a pretty, pretty interesting um, experience since he signed with Spotify, right? Signing with Spotify was meant to be the dawn of the new age with Joe Rogan podcast, the start of a new era. And now it's probably turned into more trouble than it's worth. Sands, of course, except that he's got a nice fat wad of cash in the back pockets of his trashy jeans. But um, at the moment, the latest development, allegedly through the grapevine, is that a certain segment of the Spotify, um, you know, um, 
employees have uh, essentially voiced their concerns about Joe Rogan, the guests he has on there, the topics they speak about, and they're essentially pushing for editorial um, rights or censorship abilities um, on their platform because they feel as if Joe Rogan is somehow a dangerous character on their platform. And Joe has so far not really addressed it directly apart from obviously the Tim Dillon episode he spoke about and said hey he hasn't heard anything on his side and from I from from what I've ascertained I guess from reading in between the lines I think he's probably telling the truth he probably hasn't heard anything on his side he is the big whale that Spotify have secured in order to take their podcasting um, platform to the next level they're not gonna you know uh, busy him or bother him with such uh, you know uh issues they'll deal with that stuff in-house and in general anyway unfortunately especially if you're working in a startup i think you just have to realize that when when things happen above you they just happen i've worked in many startups where you you get given the idea that you have a voice and you can sort of like set the course of the company and you can be part of the change and all this sort of bullshit but then when it comes down to it and money's on the line and decisions need to be made about the future of the company especially especially when you've got stockholders um you know who are you basically are, are responsible or you're responsible to report into some big decisions need to be made above you and they're going to be made with or without your consent and i think with these spotify employees they need to be they're probably going to be in for a rude awakening as to what happens down the line if joe rogan does in the end go you know go on to you know bringing back the people like alex jones and shit they're going to be in for a big awakening when that does happen so joe rogan in his joe rogan fashion addressed it i guess on tim dylan you know he, he kind of uh was the f that's probably the first time he did it and then he kind of put the finger in there or you know he sort of basically said hey I'm going to be a bit more cheeky and sort of push the envelope as much as I can and tweet the following video on his own Twitter account, right? And this is the following. Spotify employees censoring Joe Rogan, right? And it's a video, but these two comedians taking the piss out of some of the Spotify employees and how they go on. I'm going to play a bit of it for you now here. Let's see this. This is hilarious. I watched a bit of it earlier today, but let's watch a bit of it now. Most of it now, yeah. Uh, yeah, as Spotify employees, we're demanding the executives allow us to edit and censor Joe Rogan's podcast. Or we are walking out. Train by day, Joe Rogan podcast. Uh. <laughs> by night, all day. Joe's going yeah. for it. He doesn't He's care. Hate must be stopped. He's transphobic. He always talks about how he likes trans people, which means he doesn't love <laughs> trans people, which means he hates trans people. Hateful Joe Rogan has built a massive audience because people enjoy and respect what he and his guests have to say. But who knows better than his audience what they want to hear? We do. <laughs> hearing what Joe has to say, his audience would rather hear what we want him to be able to say. His audience just isn't intelligent enough to know what they want to hear. God damn but luckily it. here in the SJW wing, we can think for them because we're highly intelligent people. Well, kind of. I identify as a cat. But the executives at Spotify won't cater to our demands. Jesus it's Christ. almost like they value a $100 million asset more than a $49,000 asset. Now, again, you know, it's fairly, you know, you know, you know, that kind of humor. It's, it's funny for the minute, maybe not for four minutes, but you get the gist. But I guess in terms of Joe's position at Spotify, it is a bit of a power play. It is sort of him flexing his muscles and basically letting it be known that he is the alpha in this relationship. Especially, and he's also making it be known that, you know, he doesn't need these people. And I'm pretty sure Joe's savvy enough to be in a position where he sort of worked in his contract that he gets a lump sum. If they decide to fire him or terminate the contract, they're going to have to cover certain parts of the contract. They're going to have to maybe pay him an exit fee. Um, they might, you know, he, he, he'll be in, I don't think Joe will be in a position where if Spotify turn around and say, hey, this pressure from our employees is too much, we can't have you on our platform to terminate his contract, they, they, he will never be in a position where we have to give back any money. So I think he is now flexing those muscles and be like, hey, I've collected the check. I didn't need you anyway because I was big enough as it is doing my own thing. I kind of did this not as a favor, but I did this just to kind of, you know, why not, right? If someone's asking you to license your podcast on their platform and you own the internet, you own the IP for only a set amount of years and they give you a huge cash lump something in the beginning, why not? Why not do it? Do you know what I mean? Of course, there's an option in the future that he could probably work with Spotify further down the line, maybe doing some original programming and blah, 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 blah. Who knows? They might have an option to, you know, they might go into, let's say, streaming of movies and TV shows and shit. He might have a comedy special on Spotify. We don't know going forward. But just for the here and now, collecting a million dollars, 
right up front, allegedly from what we know, we've heard so far, you know, according to other people on other podcasts, they say anywhere between 100 to 200, right? And anywhere up increasing concerning, you know, performance bonuses and shit. He's in a really powerful position. So again, like I said at the beginning, unfortunately, if you're a Spotify employee and you legitimately think that your, you know, higher ups owe you, um, what, owe you enough to listen to your opinions? Again, this is coming from somebody that's worked in a startup where I was the employee number 12, right? It doesn't happen like that, especially the more successful your company is, the more um, stockholders that they have to report to, especially if they've gone, you know, if they've declared themselves public, they have to answer to too many people. Again, your boss has bosses now, unfortunately. So even if you have some actual legitimate concerns about Joe and the show that he puts together, and I guess he has on his on his on his podcast, they're gonna fall on deaf ears. You're just gonna have to, you know, actually, you know, uh, soak it up and or just move on to other avenues, unfortunately. So that was the latest development there regarding Joe Rogan. I'm interested to see what happens with it going forward. I don't think they're gonna split up or break up the terminate his contract. I just don't think so. There's too much money on the line, too much at stake. Don't get wrong there's too much money in the deal itself and there's too much money riding on spotify's decision to go with joe rogan regarding the podcasting they can't allow one of the biggest world just to kind of you know swim away because of a couple of disgruntled or you know a few disgruntled employees it's not it's not that big of a deal and again it's just so hypocritical for people at spotify to have an issue with you know Joe Rogan being on the platform and not have any issues with the copious amounts of look flipping Brian Abbott I, I assume Brian and Brian Adams music is still available on fucking Spotify do you know what I mean so that's not necessarily fair there's a lot of more there's a lot more issues with music and their lyrics than there would be a couple of comedians or whatever maybe saying some spicy things on a podcast people need to grow up and again if you don't like it just don't listen to it anyway that's the that's the best way to protest things as well don't like something turn it off don't support it don't give it any energy all this is again it's only making him more popular you know it's inspired these two comedians to go out and make a complete spoof of the whole entire issue and take umbrage or you know take some humor in your pain that you're suffering at the moment so if you're a spotify employee your best option is just ignore keep it moving but don't be surprised if your bosses don't ever listen to you cool 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 oh um and then um some other 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 news some interesting fashion news so I ordered a really interesting cap, a really cool cap from a really cool, interesting fashion brand, a brand that's been in the news recently, right? A brand that's been that's uh, been in the news for collaborating with Kanye West, right? Mawa Loa, Moa Loa, Moa Loa, Mawa Loa. Whichever way it goes, I've ordered a puff, puff, puff trucker hat from this company. And if you're familiar with that, oh, I Eric has that name. Why well, I'm familiar with it? Because that was a long, long lady that was recently announced as being the creative partner no creative director of the Yeezy and Kanye line that's due to come out very very soon so she's got a collection of her own she's a fashion designer in her own right a very it's no, a very um, well-known one not established one she's coming up she's making a name for herself doing great things you know bang your doors all that stuff so I decided to order a hat because I thought it looked cool and I still haven't got it right this is the hat right this is the hat it's an amazing hat pretty cool hat right puff puff tracker hat with the Milo logo on it right a flip of the Sony Walkman logo right essentially flipped upside down and made to look really cool and contemporary slaps on a trucker hat and if you get if you know me you know that i love trucker hats right i've got loads of them look i even got one with ears on it i've got loads of trucker hats i am a trucker hat fan look trucker hats all of them i wear all these trucker hats so when i ordered this hat i'm really i'm really interested i'm really curious to get it in, on my head on my cranium as you can see i've got a big dome i need a hat with a you know with a uh with a bit of room and a bit of girth at the back there but i still haven't received it i don't have the hat so I decided, like any other, um, you know, discerning shopper would do, to reach out to the designer via social media and say, hey, where's my hat? And you never guess what? I got a reply, but not the reply that I wanted. So, Maoloa decided to post the following image on social media, right? Uh, of this young lady in her hat, right? I don't think she works for the team. I, I, I did a hover over her name. She's just a random person, right? I don't think she was part of the Marvel design team. I don't think so. That's the case. But she's got a hat on her head. Why does she have a hat and I don't have mine? I paid money for it. So she puts a king emoji on it. And I myself go in there in the comments and say, hey, any idea when those caps are going to come out? Any idea, young lady? And guess what she says to me? 2022. <laughs> 2022 now again i'm sure she's just you know playing poking fun at him being humorous 
um, I, I'm, I'm sure they're gonna. It's gonna come some way down the line. Six weeks, four weeks. You know how these brands do in it. These brands, right? Um, they they get you to pay up front for an item that they haven't put into manufacturing yet, or they haven't made to those kind of levels of quantities. And then once you pay the money, they use that money that they, from the pre-orders, which they don't say is pre-order anymore. That's the annoying thing. They never tell you to pre-order. They just tell you to buy the thing, but then they say at the bottom, hey, it, please, um, look, please wait. Um, please, what, please what's that thing they say on um, Sicko site? Please account for four to six weeks for the shipping. But usually that's not shipping. That's usually to get the stuff made in the factory. They probably got it already specced up and shit, you know, but then they just, you know, press the button. And then from that moment, when the money comes in, they withdraw that money, send it to the factory, blah, 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 blah. But I would really hope that, again, it's the issue, it's the issue I have some of these, some of these younger brands or smaller brands, they're so, they can get really, they can get their knickers in a twist when people don't support them, Right when people go for fast fashion stuff and buy from the high street. But part of the reason is because of this kind of lack of transparency or just lack of being able to just deliver an item on time. If I order something, especially nowadays, right, we're so accustomed to ordering things on Amazon, even ordering things on Depop is sometimes quicker than ordering stuff from an individual designer. It just takes ages to get here, ages. And by the time you get it, you're falling out of love with the brand. You've annoyed yourself. You've sent emails. They've been ignored. The person's parading around in the items that you've purchased, obviously showing off the wares to drum up more interest. You still haven't got your item. You complain on this on their comments list. They delete you or they delete your comments. And you just get, this has happened, of course, with Moa Loa. Don't get me um, wrong. But I'm just talking in general. This is sexually... This essentially is what happened to um, Anti-Social Social Club, right? This is essentially what killed their brand in some way, shape or form, right? The kind of um, sentiment online is that they don't send things on time and they never answer people's questions, right? And that was part of the reason. They just treated their customers with some kind of level of discontent. And this is part of the issue that I have with it. Like, just make a comment and say, hey, guys, I know a lot of you are, are waiting for your hats. They'll be ready in about six weeks. We just need to prepare them and get them back from the factories. Obviously, with COVID, there's some delays. Say something, but now nah, it's just kind of too cool for school shit, blah de blah blah attitude it's like ugh. And sometimes i yeah i just this is the reason why i don't get involved in some of this stuff man it's just annoying in it i paid my money for the hat i want it you know what i mean just send me the hat but again 2022 i guess i need to wait for and she's probably she probably isn't joking she probably is legitimately saying 2022 by the time i legitimately get it but hey that was that made me laugh today because it was um part one part distressing and one part insightful so yeah big up at more lower i guess i'll get that puff puff truck out wherever whenever it arrives in it <clears throat> Whenever it arrives. Du, 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 du. Yeah, you know what? You know what? You know what? I think that might be it. Yeah, I think that might be it for the XNL Zinger show. That might be it. I'll leave the other stuff for tomorrow. But thanks for tuning in for the XNL Zinger show, episode number 285 oh, two, oh, two, or 2. Why do I keep saying the no wrong number? I keep saying 2. For, thank you for tuning in to episode of 385 of the Excellent Zinger Show. If it's your first time tuning into a show via YouTube, please make sure you smash the like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're tuning in via the podcast app, of course, please spread the show to your friends. Let them know about everything that I do. And I'll see you guys on the other side. Peace. Take care. Bye.